Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily with Andrew Hustler Patterson and Michael Remus. Go. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson with you, along with Michael Remus, and uh, starting a little bit early today. We do have a very busy, busy show. And um, Neil Pionk is going to be speaking with the media at one o'clock. So we figured we'd get going a little bit earlier. We've got quite a bit of things to discuss. And we're looking forward to speaking with Kevin Donnelly of True North Sports and Entertainment on the announcement yesterday on the plans to welcome fans back to the Canada Life Centre beginning in the preseason coming up. Uh, this affects the uh, Winnipeg Jets and their fans, Manitoba Moose and their fans, not to mention concerts and everything else going on at the downtown arena. So we're going to do that coming up in just a few minutes. We'll finish off with KD before we go live to Neil Pionk at 1 o'clock. Brandon Rewicki is going to join us. We'll have some uh, thoughts from... Uh, from Rue on the Neil Pionk signing, Andrew Kopp situation, where the Jets stand right now in the offseason, as well as some of his other thoughts from the National Hockey League and the rest of sports. Longtime NHLer and Manitoba native Matt Calvert has officially announced his retirement. He's going to join us. We're going to welcome in Nick Kowalski for Nick's picks and talk a little CFL before kickoff tonight between the Stamps and the British Columbia Lions. And uh, Hockey Manitoba getting back on the ice as well. We'll check in with our pal Bernie Reichardt over at Hockey Manitoba for what should be a very, very busy show. As always, we're brought to you by our newest sponsor, Canadian Club. Well, maybe cheers a few CCs at the game tomorrow night at IG Field. Cannot wait to see the Bombers again taking on the Hamilton Tiger Cats at Royal Sports. The Nick and Nicky DQ Group, Paramount Services Limited, Not Auto Corp, Boston Pizza, Little Brown Jug Brewing, Assiniboia Downs, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, Breezy Bend Country Club, and of course, our betting partner, Cool Bet Canada. Remo, welcome to the program. What's going on? Hey, just getting all settled in. You know, we're on early today. So if you didn't know or you didn't see on Twitter, make sure you hit the uh, notification bell next to the subscribe button on the channel. And but yeah, lots to get to. Who would have thought August we'd have like one of our busiest shows ever? Uh, August, <laughs> August twelve. Um, you know we have the Jets arbitration hearings. We had Pionk scheduled for tomorrow, but they avoided that, so we'll be hearing from him. Kevin Donnelly on the announcement by uh, True North yesterday about the vaccination policies for all of their venues. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of, lot of stuff going on, CFL, um, some retirement. So I'm excited for today's show. Uh, we're excited to be here early. This is awesome. Um, yes. So everyone talking about the announcement yesterday, um, and it sort of came out right at the end of our program, or actually it was after our program because it dropped actually as I was on with the guys in Calgary. And Remo, I got to tell you, it was quite hilarious to be a Winnipeg guy on in Calgary, Alberta, which um, I think most people would agree, Alberta is somewhat the Texas of Canada. Uh, they have no rules right now. And, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't looking at the text line for the conversation, and I'm glad that wasn't. But uh, Will Nault, who I was on with, and Logan Gordon speaking with, uh, you know, off air, um, you know, you realize what a polarizing subject this is in a lot of places in Canada. Um, no matter where an announcement like this is made, there will be people that push back on it. Um, it's not 100% support of anything really today in society, um, even in the situation that we're in. But to be honest, from my perspective, this was, I mean, the least surprising thing we've heard. I mean, if you have to be double vaxxed to go to a bomber game or a gold eye game, an indoor stadium holding 15,000 people. I didn't think that there was going to be any other way. Um, as I mentioned, we'll have Kevin Donnelly coming up in just a second, but uh, I'm sure from your perspective, this was not a surprise. Um, I mean, I saw the email. I, I guess, I guess yes and no. I mean, when it came out, I was like, oh, oh, really? This is big news. And I think you saw the support. I mean, this was national news yesterday. They were the first team to come out, Huss, and say, Full vax policy at all of their venues. That's including, you know, Jets games, concerts, Moose games at the now now named Canada Life Center. But also, you know, they operate the Burton Cummings. So I mean, they put it. They said uh, citing that a number of season ticket holders, a large percentage of them, you know, kind of lines up with the vaccination percentages in Manitoba. But I think it was applauded throughout the league, and I think this is something us that we're going to see going forward. And a large number of venues we're seeing this in bigger cities. In the U.S., where the variant is a problem, 
and um, you know, trying to get ahead of things here and 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 good for, good on uh, on True North and for making the right decision, I believe. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, I mean, I think that you know, and we'll we'll get into this. We'll ask Kevin Donnelly all of this, but I mean, certainly from all the reports, I mean, they did. I mean, I'm a season ticket holder. Um, I got the, the questionnaire which asked me uh, my thoughts on the upcoming season, what I would feel comfortable going to, uh, you know, would I be back, all of those things, um, and you know, thoughts on you know, do fans need to be vaccinated? So. Um, you know, I know in some circles, this is controversial. Uh, it's not really to me. I mean, I'm like, like, did I want to go get a needle? Well, no, obviously. I mean, that's not something you wake up, go, yeah, I can't wait to go to the doctor and get a shot. Um, but with the situation that we're in, um, my motivation, everyone's is different. I mean, obviously you want to protect those around you, uh, but also to do exactly this, get back into the arena downtown and watch the Winnipeg Jets and do what we did last Thursday, getting together with 30,000 people at IG Field to watch the Bombers and get back to the ballpark and be able to go to Assiniboia Downs. So um, everyone's got their own reasoning for whatever they're doing right now, uh, but in the interest of public safety and, of course, in the interest of business. Um, you know, the, the Winnipeg Jets have taken, like everybody else in this industry, have taken a massive financial hit over the last couple of seasons. And they absolutely need us back in the building. And they need as many of them as possible. And while there will be a small segment of the population that will oppose this, um, I think overall, certainly as we're seeing the general reaction from this and what Jet Season ticket holders said to True North when they were asked, um, I think there's far a far greater amount of people that are in and will be in and will attend games with the rules that they put out this year. And uh, listen, I, like everyone, hope that we can get to a point where there are no recommendations, that we're not dealing with this. But it's pretty clear that we're not there yet. Uh, no one is there yet. And, you know, I, I think we're lucky in the fact that we have had the buy-in um, for the shots that we've had here in Manitoba over the last few months that have put us in a relatively envious position as opposed to many other places in North America. Um, but as far as we're concerned here, bottom line is we want to get the information out to everyone and know that there will be hockey being played. If you've got your tickets, you can go. And what you need to do to make sure you're a part of that crowd to see this new look Winnipeg Jets team when they drop the puck in a month or two. Yeah, well well said, Hus. And I think Manitoba's put themselves in a really nice position here with the you know digital QR codes combined with the physical card. Um, it's amazing that they were able to produce, you know, such a futuristic thing when we're still using the paper for the health number, which has been a running <laughs> joke. And I know um, Quebec seems to be going that route as well. I think Ontario just has like a paper, uh, like a paper receipt that you get. So I'm I personally one shock Manitoba is so ahead of the curve on this. And I, I saw, you know, hockey media, um, you know, top doctors applauding the Jets for and True North for their decision uh, yesterday. So. Um, it was again. We we did record this earlier, but it was great catching up with Kevin and hearing all all the details from him and, and what went into it. Yeah. Well, listen, I wasn't at all surprised to see hockey media and people in, on Twitter being supportive of this. I mean, the unfortunate thing is, in in reality, right now, is there's such a disconnect from what you see on a platform like that and talking to real people every day. I mean, listen, if you watch Twitter, I mean, you would think that a the er world is ending every single day and that it's 100% in support of the most extreme, extreme, you know, um, conditions when it comes to protecting people from the virus. And, you know, unfortunately, I think that, you know, there's very, very much differing viewpoints. And the thing that I hate the most about it all is that it's got all so political. I mean, I think Eric in chat makes a great point. He just says, I'm with us. I wasn't excited to get the needle, but for myself, I thought it's the best thing for me to do to be able to go out and somewhat do normal things again. And 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 that's the way it is. Um, and Sean Gagne makes a great point. Season ticket holders need to have their first shot by Sunday in order to have been double vaxxed in time for game one, because there is, of course, a time period that you have to wait and get it on. So God knows we spent enough time talking about all of this, but it is important today um, because for hockey fans, and that's what we talk about, you know, our teams and going to games, um, this is very important. So had a chance just before we came on today to catch up with Kevin Donnelly, Vice President uh, at True North Sports and Entertainment. Um, Kevin is a, a brilliant mind in the entertainment industry. I've known him for a very long time, and I've actually wanted to get him on the program for a longer conversation at some point, uh, just to get his perspective on where the sports and entertainment industry goes from here, um, how different it looks afterwards, what might change forever. But 
obviously we started off talking about the announcement yesterday and what this means for Winnipeg Jet fans, Manitoba Moose fans, uh, concert attendees, as well as everything else that goes on in the downtown arena, and as well as Michael Remus mentioned, uh, the Burton Cummings Theatre. So here it is, just from about half an hour ago, we caught up with Kevin Donnelly of True North Sports and Entertainment on the announcement yesterday on the rules and requirements to get into the arena this year. KD, thanks so much for doing this. It's great to have you on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a uh, thrill to be here, Pastor. Oh, oh. Well, it's, I mean, I'm sure it's thrilling for everyone to be talking about actually having fans back in the building. Um, you know, before we talk about what was announced yesterday, if you can tell us about how these decisions were come to the amount of collaboration you had within the organization, uh, within other stakeholders, and of course, your fans as well. Well, obviously, sports and entertainment and hospitality has been just wildly impacted by, by by COVID. And so, you know, as a company, we we have taken to such a deep, look into all the science, all the news, all, all the stats we can follow right from the get go. I mean, you know, no, nobody knew the extent to which this is going to play out and the timeline in which we, so we've been following this with a notion that it's going to turn in a week. It's going to turn in a month. It's going to turn in three months. And we we've needed to be ready for the for what we thought was going to be the, the the start of the return. So, you know, watching the metrics, watching the math, watching the science of of, of you know that that we can glean from our health office, our you know diff, different different sources, um, just so that we can be informed. And then we take that and and we create our own opinion for a company. What's best for for True North? What's best for Manitobans? What's best for the Winnipeg Jets and our fan base? And and you just put that in the blender and you try to come up with. A policy, a plan, a, 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 an organizational statement, uh, and just you know keep keep the doors open, the lights on, and 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 the wheels turning. So, it has been an endeavor. It has been across the whole organization. You, you know, HR, security, marketing, planning, finance has been insanely expensive to keep the team together without an audience. And uh, but we're here. We see the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. We're going to have exhibition games starting in a little over a month right now. And uh, and so we're, you know, we're gearing up. Um, well, let's talk about the announcement yesterday. I mean, I don't think it was any surprise to, to anyone around here, considering the way things have gone when it comes to the virus, as well as what we've seen happening with the outdoor venues like the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and the Gold Eyes mm -hmm. and now with Cinnaboy Downs, um, that people would have to be vaccinated. But maybe if you could... Just summarize for people that maybe haven't read the release. How will things work? Winnipeg Jet fans, you want to go to a game this year. What do you need to know and what do you need to do? Uh, games, concerts, moose games, uh, er everything in within our realm, uh, which is the Canada Life Center, the Burton Cummings Theater, uh, and any other event we're attached to, um, you have to be fully vaccinated to attend. Our staff are going to be fully vaccinated to be employed by True North. And our suppliers, we're asking our suppliers that when they send workers to, to do whatever services that they're contracted to do, they send vaccinated contracted employees. So we're trying to be consistent. We're trying to be just a blanket statement. We want our coworkers, our colleagues to be safe, to be to be protected. And we want to be able to provide that to our audiences, and our fans that, that come through the door. So fully vaccinated to, to attend, fully vaccinated to work. Um, and and you know masking is something that we're watching uh, right now. That we're saying that you have to wear a mask indoors, uh, except for while eating or, or consuming you know a beverage or something. So different from outside. Outside has different considerations than indoors. Indoor space, you know, tight confines. Um, it, it has a different different set of um, standards than, than outdoors. So. We, we applaud what the bombers were able to achieve. We, we, we're with them and, and think that they're on the right path. Indoors is a different animal. And so we're, we're going down our road the way we are. Well, I, okay, I, I wanted to ask you about the masking because I, the one thing I did hear from a few people is, um, you know, everyone expected that, you know, this was going to be a, a vaccinated building considering mm -hmm. what we've seen in our other venues. Um, but the mask requirements was, I, I think, something that maybe caught a few people off guard and that, you know, with an entirely fully vaccinated building, I think, you know, some people uh, were hoping that, you know, would be more like the outdoor venues. So how is mm -hmm. that different? And is that subject to change, I guess, Kevin? 
I think that that part is. I mean, we're expecting that part to. I, I think the masking thing, masking protects you, as we all know, and we've heard it a thousand times. You can still catch COVID even if you're vaccinated, but masking helps reduce that spread. So uh, that. Our policy will follow the the infection rate in the market as that really drops, and it is dropping uh, to a point where we don't have to be as 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 strict on that. Uh, we're willing to amend that. Our belief, and again, the provincial health order only uh, issued a blanket statement for uh, events up to fifteen hundred. Everything over fifteen hundred indoors has to be submitted to the government for approval. So, if we were to submit that approval today, we would expect that masks would be a requirement. In six weeks, when we start the season, it's likely going to be different. If Manitobans continue to do the right thing and if the spread doesn't take off like we're seeing in places like Florida and whatnot. So I think the masking requirement is a more fluid statement. It's currently required. Um, it might likely get to recommend it and, and give a, a patron option, but the vaccination status won't change. We are going to be a double vaccinated, fully vaccinated facility for the foreseeable future. Kevin Donnelly of True North Sports and Entertainment with us discussing the upcoming season at the Canada Life Centre and what this means for fans that want to go and attend events in downtown Winnipeg. Kevin, you mentioned all the collaboration within the organization and with health officials, which goes without saying. Um, I know you did. I mean, as a season ticket holder, I mean, all of us got the uh, got the questionnaire. Tell us about the interactions and what you heard from fans and how impactful that was in helping you get to this point. Again, you know, we we spend just un- uncountable hours trying to trying to understand the science and understand what this what this means to us as a business and 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 us as an operator within the community. But going out and asking the fans, we thought was a critical point to add to to the, you know, the the matrix when you're making these decisions. And the overwhelming response, I think it was upwards of 84 percent of our fans liked the notion of being a fully vaccinated house. So. We landed there before we asked the question of the of our of our fans and patrons, but hearing that response confirmed that we were on the right path. Confirmed that we think that we're doing the appropriate thing in providing as safe and as healthy an environment as we possibly can uh, to the people that enter the building. So it was great validation for the path we were on, but we were we were heading down that road anyway. But again, eighty four percent of Jets fans surveyed said. They wanted a vaccinated venue. Um, Kevin, you sort of alluded to this off the top, but um, are there any differences between a Winnipeg Jets game, a Moose game, a metal concert, a family event? I mean, you've got a, it's a very busy building under normal times. Yeah. Um, short answer is no. A fully vaccinated crowd for, for all events. I mean, when you get into uh, kids under 12 that currently cannot be vaccinated, so they're allowed to attend with a vaccinated patron. Um, you know, masking on, on, on children, again, is, is something that we're watching. Again, it, it falls right now under the everyone's required to wear a mask. But as we get a little closer, you know, at Disney on Ice or a Moose game where, where there's larger percentages of kids in the building, um, I would suggest people check back with us before then in case that mask requirement changes just so that they're fully aware but at the moment everybody of every age group we're saying required to wear a mask indoors except for when consuming food or beverage uh it's been an unprecedented time in the world um and some industries have been affected more than others the entertainment and sports industry is right at the top of the list can you tell what have the last 18 plus months been like for you and and what's been happening at the at the rink Um, when uh you know, it hasn't been filled for whatever, 200 nights a year. Well, again, in a word, it's been terrible. It, it, it has been, you know, I've been in this business for over 30 years. I've never gone 18 months without being at a show, presenting a show, booking a show, selling a show. So this is, you know, new for me and it, and it hasn't been fun. Uh, True North and, you know, our ownership have been unbelievable, but we haven't laid off anybody. So we took the 200 staff and redeployed them to do whatever we could afford to do. The money dried up. So bigger projects were shelved for a year, but we had an, an army of people that we were able to clean seats, paint walls, you know, polish railing, do everything we can do to get the building in as most pristine condition as we possibly could. Bigger projects that, you know, people have seen complete uh, concourse renovations, those have been shelved. Those have been pushed back. But when you return, you'll see 
the building looking as great as it as it ever had. Both buildings, the Burt looks incredible. Uh, the arena is ready to go. We have made some significant changes. We've added um, on ice projection for the game presentation. So we haven't stopped spending money, but the major projects we have deferred for a year. Um, but you yeah, man, we're looking forward to it. We just want to get back. We have we have horses in the stables ready to get out and do what they do. So it's coming. You mentioned about booking all um you know all the events and for people that don't know I mean you've been in the concert business as you mentioned for thirty years and been with True North for a number of years putting on everything that goes into uh, Bell MTS or the former Bell MTS place now Canada yep. Life Center or Canada Life Place what um how busy is this building going to be going forward and um, maybe give us a bit of an idea I mean everyone knows what the hockey schedule is outside of hockey events will there be other events do you have concerts coming are there other things as as well as at the Burt. Well, I, I think that the concert industry is having its struggles starting up again. You know, there's been some festivals that have picked a certain date and have come out of the gates. Lollapalooza was a big example, but that occurs in a one market on one date. And, and it was easy for those people or easier for those people to, to keep that band together, to keep that team together. Tours, you know, as this Delta variant is, is impacting America, they're having real trouble planning where where can they safely go? Where can they take tours from from market to market? And and the issue of international travel is still unresolved. So, it is starting. It is going to come back. There's a lot of talent that is pent up. There, there's pent up uh, uh, inventory that that's ready to go out. But it's starting up slower than what I'd like to see. We're going to have Eric Church on on October the second. That's going to be our first major event at capacity. I mean country superstar you know we'll have 10 12 000 people in the building but i think you won't see the kind of activity that we had in the arena until you know first second quarter of 2022 um kevin for people going to the games and i'll, I'll preface this with saying i was one of the thirty thousand that was at the uh, the stadium the ig field last weekend for the bomber game and uh, and having worked on the other side of things, knowing the planning that must have gone into that, um, you know, after being off, the staffing issues, all that. I mean, there were some incredible challenges. Mm -hmm. One of the things that they did do, though, was move to a cashless concession system. And it was very obvious that whether it was because it was new or there wasn't enough people or the demand was high, that it was, uh, I mean, the amount of time that it took to get something I mean, to be perfectly honest, Bombers probably left a hundred grand plus on the table just because they weren't able to sell everything. How is that going to work uh, at the arena downtown? And uh, do you have any concerns? Uh, we'll put it this way. If that is, why? And are, is there any concerns that that's going to impact the, the ability of people to get what they want and not miss too much of the event? Yeah, we're taking a slightly different approach than what the Bombers did. We're going to have cashless options everywhere. So the hawker's going to have a little tap thing that you can purchase with a cash-free transaction at, at every point of sale. But we are still going to take tender. We are going to take currency. So we are not cashless, but the cap, the cashless option will become available for you at any any point for, for any, any kind of transaction. And I got to put a caveat there. I think... 50 50 because that that's more complicated by the the, the the lottery system and and the the um you know the 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 uh just just the the, the draw selection i don't know that they're going to be cashless or cash options so um we will for concession for beer for popcorn for all the food items for merchandise you will have a cashless payment option but not only cashless. We will okay. take currency. Yeah. That's good. That's good news. I think that'll make yep. things uh, as smoother and you know, obviously for the bottom line too. I mean, you want to be able to sell your product in as many ways as possible, as easily yeah, and, and think, as quickly as possible. And I think in fairness to the bombers, again, they've been out of the game as long as we have. It's going to take us a while to get back to the you know the smooth running systems that we had in place. So I think they did it. They did a good job as best as they could to their ability. You know it's tough when you start with a full house. I mean you, you, there's not a lot of oh. training that you can. You can't practice at a half house. There's no house, and then there's a full house. So well, it's, and, it's tough. And the other thing that I'll say is that you know because this was the first event, and this really was a huge event for the community. Um, mm -hmm. You know more than just the CFL and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Um, you had so many people that were, oh, how long is it going to take me to get in? I sure right. as hell don't want to miss the Grey Cup banner going up. Yep. So, I mean, like the place was almost full at 20 after six. 
And yeah, isn't that it's incredible? normally a yeah. later arriving crowd and, you know, yeah. the preparations yeah. for that. But even the Bombers said as much right after the game that they knew that there's some improvements that they need to make and looking forward to seeing how that goes tomorrow. Uh, but the bottom line is, I think for everyone, just happy to have the opportunity to get back, see people we haven't seen for a long time, cheer on our local teams and uh, anyway, have a good time. Uh, before we go, KD, um, you, as I mentioned, I mean, I've always wanted to ask you this question and it's sort of, I'm sure, changed throughout the course of the pandemic, but there's no better you know, experience in this industry than you. Um, at what point, I guess a lot of this has to do with, you know, the variants and all that stuff, but mm -hmm. how, how will, how will this industry, what part of this industry might be permanently changed going forward? I mean, are there, are there elements of what we remember that will never be going back to you in your mind? I don't know. You know, I, I, I hope not much because, you know, we weren't that uninformed before we weren't, we weren't that, we weren't that sort of underachieving before the pandemic. We had, we, we offered a pretty good product. And when I say we, I mean NASCAR and NFL and NBA and NHL and the concert industry. We, we all were pretty good at what we did. You learn things all the time. You learn what's important. You know, the amazing part is how much social gathering, how much getting together, how much the word concert and sporting events was mentioned in the opening statement of normal life. How important these things have become to society was was really uh, validating for me, who's put a career into the into the industry. But also, when you hear that that is inherently important to society, that 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 opportunity to get together, like you said, high five people at the rum hut, see people you don't see on a regular basis or through your workday, um, it, it it's a it's been a reminder that we are social animals. And that these opportunities, sporting events, concert events, have become a really key component of, of our social being. Kevin, this is great. Last question for you. Um, you know, uh, anyone that has, um, you know, friends in the hospitality industry or has gone out has seen, you know, some incredible challenges when it comes to hospitality, entertainment, when it comes to staffing. I mean, you mentioned how, I mean, no one was laid off through this. You also have a huge amount of temporary staff that would not mm -hmm. have had events um, where are you as far as that goes? And is that going to be a challenge when fans are back in the building? Uh, we are, we are short. We are, we are going to engage in a job fair. There's going to be lots of opportunity for people who are interested in joining our team to, to get engaged in a part-time position. You know, every department has, has gaps to fill at this point. So it's something that we know we have to do. We have to train these people before, uh, before the first puck drops, um, you know, we know that we won't be as fluid as we were when we, when we started or when we ended um, previous to the pandemic. So we, we've we got a little bit of a road ahead of us. We've identified it. We know what we have to do. Uh, again, the good news is Manitobans, um, we, we've got a good story here in this building with our hockey team. And people feel an immense amount of pride when they get engaged with it. And our staff are quite loyal. So we've got a a healthy number coming back, but we know we have we have holes to fill, and we're in the process of doing that. So if you are interested, there's a job fair coming, and uh, we look forward to meeting and making new friends. So there's opportunities, but it just is what it is. We're going to have to hire them, train them, and, and get them ready to go. Well, of course, all that information will be up on the Jets website, I'm sure True North website, and um, yep. let us know. We'll make sure we let people know at, uh, here at Winnipeg Sports Talk. KD, I cannot wait to see you in, uh, in person and uh, high five you after a Jets goal running through the concourse <laughs> at some point in the 300 level this year. All the best Absolutely. to you and the staff, and we'll uh, look forward to seeing you back at the rink. Thank you very much. Good, good to see you. All right, there was Kevin Donnelly caught up with him just before we went live today here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Really appreciate Kevin taking the time to join us and sort of explain, you know, how they came to this decision and bottom line, what does it means for fans? Uh, because I know the vast majority of us cannot wait to get back into the uh, into the arena and see this hockey team. And uh, that hockey team is going to have Neil Pionk, who signed a four-year deal yesterday with the Winnipeg Jets. Pionk's going to be meeting the media in just a few moments. We are hoping to have him on uh, the program at some point next week. Uh, but we'll hear his first comments in signing the deal with all of the Winnipeg media coming up. We'll carry that live for you. Part of the reason why we 
jumped on a little bit earlier today. Uh, for everyone that's jumping in going, what the hell? You guys are already on. Yeah, we started at 1230 today. Um, if you haven't already, I'm sure most of you are, but if you haven't already, make sure you hit that red subscribe button. And if you hit the bell, it'll turn on notifications where when we are live, you'll just get a little notification saying, hey, Winnipeg Sports Talk is live and you can get right in there. Um, I have a feeling there's been a couple times during the playoffs where we went on on a long weekend. Um, there's been a couple of cases where because of whether it be press conferences or whatnot that we wanted to carry, we've gone a little bit early. So if you don't want to miss any of our broadcasts live, make sure you have that bell on. And otherwise, if you're just tuning in right now, uh, welcome to the program. We just had a great interview with Kevin Donnelly from True North on the announcement yesterday of the rules and requirements to attend events at the downtown arena. Uh, you can simply back it up and watch it now or catch it at the end of the program. And of course, if you're listening on the podcast right now, uh, great to have you with us. Make sure to uh, check out the YouTube if you haven't been uh, if you haven't done it before. I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, but also, if you have the opportunity to uh, give us a five star rating there on Apple Podcasts and a little review, it certainly helps out in a big, big way. All right. Uh, before we get to Neil Pionk, do want to thank some of our sponsors, including Canadian Club. I know there'll be a lot of CC uh, being poured tomorrow night in the uh, incredible social area in the north end of the stadium, the Brugal Ramahat, the Jim Beam Stillhouse, and you'll be able to get CC at any of those spots, as well as uh, maybe even a little Sousa tequila, all part of the Beam Suntory family, which is now on board as our official spirits partner here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Now, I mentioned, I teased that we have an incredible, incredible prize from CC to give away through a, a fun promo. We'll kind of have details on that next week um, because it was such a good prize. I didn't want to do it on short notice. I wanted to let more people know about it, um, kind of maximize the value of it. But I will tell you tomorrow, we will have an I Love Rye package to give away. Um, so make sure you're with us live on YouTube. End of the program tomorrow, getting ready for the Bombers and Argos. We'll give away that package through one of our famous Friday marble races. So I'm looking forward to have people back. Thanks so much. And if you're looking for the best, look no further than Canadian club. Cannot wait for this game tomorrow night. And I guess we will do some cheersing. And if you see me at the game, uh, make sure to ask me. I'll try and bring some more Winnipeg sports talk koozies. Um, of course, Royal sports, you know, uh, people might need to get down to Royal sports before tomorrow's game for a couple reasons. Number one, they'll be able to go and pick up, maybe a new Neil Pionk jersey, and of course, all their Blue Bomber gear for the game tomorrow night. Um, but it's so much more than just the best selection of licensed merchandise anywhere. Um, it's the hockey superstore, soccer, baseball, tennis, a great camping section, and of course, bikes as well. Um, so Royal, Royal Sports 650 Rally EK and 750 Pembina Highway. All right, let's hear from Neil Pionk of the Winnipeg Jets, who's meeting the media right now. All right, we're going to get to Neil Pionk in just a second. I do see Nick, uh, DQ Nick in the house. Um, shout out, oh, you know, of course, Nikki, Nikki, DQ, great sponsors of ours. Four locations, DQ Niverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's. And um, <laughs> if you've seen DQ was trending yesterday on Twitter, I know Remus and I will get into that a little bit later on, but the demand for the ice Maybe cream take... cakes is real. Go and see our friends, Nick and Nikki DQ. And right now, let's listen to Neil Pionk the, the Winnipeg Jets. signings happening around the league, especially for offensive defensemen, some big, big numbers being handed out. Um, do you feel like maybe you left some money on the table to try and get this, just, you know, keep the group together, get this all to fit under the cap? Well, it's, it's all part of negotiation, right? Like, I think each side probably had to give up a little bit. Um, uh, you, can you turn it up? And, 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 and that's where we came kind of met in the middle and negotiated, so to speak. So um, maybe some people uh, say I left money on the table. Other people I, say I can't my good friends say I'm overpaid. So depends who you YouTube ask, but no, I'm, I'm just okay, really excited that, that it worked for both sides and, and that I'm uh, able to be part of the team for the next four years. Go back to Mike McIntyre. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, and just on that point, Neil, I mean, with the additions that, that were made, uh, Nate, as you mentioned, obviously, Brendan Dillon, getting Paul Stasny back, some of the young guys in the system. I mean, where do you see this group heading into the fall and in this window, I guess, uh, of, of your four-year deal? 
yeah, I'm really excited about it. Um, yeah, obviously there's, we have a, a winning window and, and I see us as contenders too. So like we, we make those signings and, and uh, bringing back Staz and, and making those trades. I mean, they're, they're huge for our team and, and uh, I'm excited to get going. We'll go next to uh, Kelly Moore from 680 CJOB. Go ahead, Kelly. Thanks very much, Gregor. Uh, congratulations on the deal, Neil. Uh, just further to a little bit to what Mike said with respect to the structure of the contract, it does take you a couple of years into free agency. Uh, is that something that, you know, you had some chats with the team about looking at things long range uh, for, you know, what, whatever we think you've given up in the first couple of years of the, of uh, testing the free agent market. Right. Yeah. So like, that's, again, it's, it's part of negotiation. Like um, we looked at it, we looked at a lot of different options, uh, whether it's a, a longer term deal, uh, a one or two year deal. Um, but obviously we, we kind of met in the middle again and, and we negotiated and that's, that's part of the business of hockey and, and a four year deal just worked for both sides. So next uh, back to Kelly Moore. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, just to follow up, Neil, uh, again, when you take a look at the depth uh, of this blue line, <laughs> have you kind of envisioned, uh, you know, some of the different uh, uh, possibilities uh, going into this season and in the next couple of years after that, too? Yeah, there's a lot of possibilities. Um, as, from a team perspective, I think I think uh, we have we have a great chance to win. Like we bolstered our blue line, and obviously we know the forward group that we have, and and we have Helly and Net. So um, I think it I think it increased our chances to win by a lot. Let's go next to Carter Brooks from Game On. Go ahead, Carter. Hey Neil, congratulations on the contract as well as your engagement with Kara this summer. That's uh, great news for you. Um, I yesterday True North issued a statement suggesting that uh, the the arena would sell to capacity for this coming year. How exciting is that for you, A, and B, how important is it to you to see True North and the Jets putting that statement out, one of the first teams in all professional sports to do something like that? Yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, you know, even I remember playing that, that playoff game against uh, Montreal when they let, uh, I think it was 500 healthcare workers in. And even with 500 people, like I, I kind of got chills going on the ice because it's like, you know, it was the first time and however many months we actually had some fans in our home building and had some noise. So, um, and I, I know it's one of the, the loudest buildings in the league with a, a full capacity crowd. So I can't wait. Back to Mike McIntyre from the free press. Go ahead, Mike. Neil, uh, obviously in the hockey business and the sports business, there's always going to be turnover. So you bring some new guys in, but you have to say goodbye to a couple faces and one that you obviously spent a lot of time with last year in, in Derek Forbert. Um, do you have much conversation with Derek and Tucker uh, and, and other guys forwards, you know, like Matthew and that, that, that moved on and just some thoughts on, on, you know, saying goodbye to those guys. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Like that's the, the business side of the, the game. That's, that's uh, really sucks. Like you, you become good friends with some of those guys. Um, and obviously we stay in contact through the summer. So uh, of course, texted all three of them, you know, congrats on their new deals, but yeah, we're definitely going to miss them uh, around the locker room. Go next to Kelly Moore from 680 CJOB. Go ahead, Kelly. You, know, you mentioned uh, that Nate Schmidt is one of your good friends. I'm just wondering, do you get a word in edgewise uh, in any of the conversations? Because he was absolutely fantastic uh, when we talked to him uh, earlier this year when he came over from the trade. Yeah, so I know Schmidt a little bit. Um, we played, I think we played in the beauty, that uh, beauty league down in, in Minneapolis a few years ago. We played together and, and against each other. Had a couple short conversations, but yeah, he's, he's, he's a... Uh, He's a ball of energy, so he's he'll be uh, bring a lot of life to the locker room. I'm sure. How do you have a uh, uh, sorry? How do you have a short conversation with Nate Schmidt? Well, when I say short, I mean he talked and I listened. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, you can never have uh, you can never have enough Minnesota guys on the team. That's for sure. Back to Mike McIntyre. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, and just one last one for me, Neil. But obviously, you spent most of the year paired with Derek that was a very consistent pair. So you're going to get a new partner. Um, any idea, I guess, who you might be playing with? There's, there are a lot of different possibilities, but and any, any preference that you'd have? No, there's a lot of possibilities, right? And uh, no preference for me personally, but um, I think the biggest thing for me going into camp is if I do play with somebody new that came in a trade or, or maybe it's a recent signing, um, to get to know them as well as I can. And, and it might be something as little as having a conversation 
uh, off the ice, but not only that, uh, getting to know their tendencies on the ice, uh, watching the littlest things that they do, uh, maybe have a conversation about how you'd like to play a certain play, what kind of plays you like to make with the puck. So the faster you can build that chemistry, um, the better off you're going to be. Back to Carter Brooks. Go ahead, Carter. Hey, Neil. And Nate's availability earlier, he suggested that Brennan Dillon was a really tough guy to play against. I'm sure you, you've you seen him. But what do you know about him as A, a person, and B, a, a player? I've, I've heard good things. Um, obviously, hockey's a pretty small world, so I've, I've heard really good things about him. Uh, as a player just playing against him, I know that our forwards hated playing against him. So he's one of those guys, like, you hate playing against him, but you want to have on your team bad. So I, I was really happy to, to see that we picked him up. Thanks very much for doing this, Neil. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. For the Winnipeg Jets discussing his contract. We'll uh, hopefully hook up with Neil at some point in the uh, next week or so. We'll welcome him in and discuss the new contract here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. But as you saw by the uh, expert screen work of Michael Remus, the tweet from Elliot Friedman as we were listening to Neil Pionk, breaking news. The summer of Chevy is just about done. Andrew Kopp has signed a one-year deal with the Winnipeg Jets, a $3.64 million extension on a one-year deal, which will bring him to unrestricted free agency at the end of next season. Let's get Remus in here. Brandon Rewicki is going to join us in a couple of minutes. Um, Remo, this is basically exactly what we talked about yesterday on the program, um, both between the two of us as well as with Murata Tesh. That with the Pionk deal being signed at the term and the length that it was that it came in at, it didn't give a lot of wiggle room to put together a number that I think was available that would get Andrew Kopp to sign a long term deal. And you know, we talked plenty about the arbitration case a couple of years back between the Winnipeg Jets and Kopp and what he had to say afterwards. Um, this to me was the most logical outcome of it, and you know, from an asset management perspective, um, you know, you don't like to lose a guy that's been a big part of your team, um, you know, as a free agent at the end of the year. But looking at the other options, uh, what Kopp would garner on the trade market right now and what the loss of Andrew Kopp would do to the lineup this season, I don't think that was palatable for the Winnipeg Jets. So uh, I'll be honest, I didn't think this would come and happen this quickly. Uh, but I think Kevin Sheveldayoff and Kurt Overhart get credit for getting this done. They worked on a number that was palatable to both sides. And Andrew Kopp is going to come in next season on a one-year deal, knowing that he is playing on the ultimate contract year with ultimate, with unrestricted free agency hanging at the end of the season. And, you know, at that point, if there's a potential that the Winnipeg Jets can do things and sign him long-term, I'm sure that'll be discussed. If not, he'll have the opportunity to go to the highest bidder. But from a Jet perspective with where the team is at and what they hope to do next season, uh, I don't think that the I probably I don't really don't think the option of trading cop was thought about too long. You know, they may lose him at the end of the year, but I think the value of Andrew, having Andrew Cop in the lineup this season made this the logical and right thing to do. Sorry, Huss. I'm like feverishly uh, tweeting and uh, getting our social graphics ready. And we did talk about this yesterday. Um, is it a possible that, you know, it's pretty clear right now with the way the salary cap is, Andrew Kopp can't get long-term big money in Winnipeg. It's just not feasible the way they're up against the salary cap. So would he go for a one-year contract and better himself if he's, you know, hoping to get to that big free agency opportunity in the future? And for the Jets, you're basically saying, okay, this guy is a one-year rental. And I don't think there's any wrong with anything wrong with that. If I mean, it's pretty clear that this is the way it's been headed for a while. It seems like Cop and his agent realize, you know what? They don't. They simply don't have the money this year. So let's sign this one-year deal. And if you do want to stay long-term, well, you know what? Maybe January you can start negotiating a long-term extension for next year when they do have more money. And I mean, people were asking, well, can you give him less money? No, no, no it's AAV. So everyone knows AAV. So there's no way they could have fit him in for a long-term deal. And I I'm I like his move. You got him signed. You have him next year, and it's pretty clear right now, Huss, that the Jets are are AI. They're going all in for this next three year window, starting with this season. And Andrew Kopp, he's basically a one year your own rental. And then maybe do you make a trade depending on health, depending on injuries, depending on how things are going at the deadline, and trade away a first round pick, or 
you know, do you look to trade Cop um, to another team, for, you know, for another first round pick, and then maybe flip a pick? I don't, I don't know, but I think it's a, he's definitely a, an asset, and you have well, him for the season. I'll say this right now. I think the only way Andrew Cop gets traded by the Winnipeg Jets, yeah, if the team isn't up to snuff this season and they are, you know, they they they're a disappointment and. Because Andrew Kopp's too important to this club to not have in the stretch, to not have in the playoffs. And, you know, if, if he's not there next season, uh, if they're not able to 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 keep him here long term, you'll have options in the offseason. I mean, Paul Stastny signed a deal just south of $4 million. It's a one-year deal. Not sure where he's going to be at next year, whether he continues to play, whether it's here in Winnipeg. So there is some money that comes off the books. At that point, of course, you've got Pierre Luc Dubois. His contract, his fin- that finishes up at five million dollars. He's an RFA with arbitration. But again, the center position could look totally different at that point. You could have potentially a Cole Perfetti, maybe already being you know playing in the National Hockey League, ready to take a bigger role. So, you know, in the short term, I, it, we'll talk to Brandon Rewicki about this coming up. I mean, it's hard to nitpick anything that Kevin Cheveldayoff's done this year. I mean, it started with those two big defense acquisitions and to think that they were able to add the $10 million to the cap on the blue line and get Logan Stanley signed, Neil Pionk on a four-year deal and Andrew Kopp back in the mix this year. Um, You know, to me, this is best case scenario for the Winnipeg Jets. And, you know, we've felt a lot of the excitement from Jet fans really dating back to the two acquisitions of Brendan Dillon and Nate Schmidt. But many people thought that that sort of meant that the writing was on the wall, that they wouldn't be able to keep Andrew Kopp. And, you know, I think as a Jets fan, you have to look at this decision that in the past might not have been the way the team would go as they tried to build assets and draft and develop. They're looking to win right now. And Andrew Kopp helps this team win. And he's a very important player on this club. And from Kopp's standpoint, you know, he had a phenomenal season last year. If he can go and do that again this year, you know, Andrew Kopp will be one of those guys that they'll be talking about like they did Barkley Goodrow and, um, you know, maybe more so like Blake Coleman, you know, who was, you know, getting in and around $5 million a year on a long-term deal. So Kopp's going to be incredibly motivated to have a, an incredible season and the success of the team and the opportunity to show what he can do in the postseason, I think will be a big part of that as well. So, um, you know, I... I we did consider quite a bit that maybe they could trade him and maybe things would look different, but how different does that third line? Mason Appleton's already a member of the Seattle Kraken, but Kopp and Lowry are the glue of the middle six of the Winnipeg Jets. I mean, even when things haven't been going on the second line, Paul Maurice has been able to lean on those guys in some of the toughest matchups, and it's been a big part of the success that the Winnipeg Jets have had. Um, Let's take a quick look and see what people are saying in the uh, the comments right now. I have to think that, you know, Sandy and G, I really think Cop wants to stay with the Jets. I guess time will tell. Dang, cannot wait for the start of the season. Justin F, Chevy, GM of the year, front runner. Um, well, we already raised the offseason champs banners before all this came done. So certainly the offseason, I, I think it would be you'd be hard pressed to find a guy that did more um, to fix the issues that his hockey team had and do it in, you know, a flat cap world with keeping all of his players and adding two really impactful guys. So uh, John H what a summer for Chevy unreal. Um, so there, there's quite a bit of feedback on this. You can continue to give us your thoughts on the cop extension and how you see this going on. Um, but this is great news for the Winnipeg jets. And uh, as I said, you don't like to lose assets for nothing. But this is there's the potential that that happens, and it's happened before with a player like Ben Sherrod or with Tyler Myers, and it'll continue to happen. But overall, when you look at what the Jets have done with retaining all of you know the talent on you know the young talent you know, between Connor and Shifley and Ehlers, of course Adam Lowry with the five year commitment, and then you know your top five defensemen locked up for the next three seasons. Um, This is the window right now for the Winnipeg Jets, and that's why we talked about it yesterday. I didn't think that we'd see anything beyond a one-year deal. Didn't think arbitration was a good idea for the club, and the fact that it happened today, very interesting that we got it in so quickly. We're going to talk about it with Brandon Rewicki in just a second. 
Um, we mentioned, well, we'll touch on DQ a little later on because I know Remus has some hot takes on the helicopter incident for the DQ cake in Saskatchewan a little earlier. Um, but I do want to thank one of our newest sponsors, Paramount Services Limited, for uh, their support of Winnipeg Sports Talk and let you know about the company, which services convenience stores and restaurants in Western Canada 24 hours a day, 365, and they've been doing it for almost 30 years. Um, they will take care of your HVAC, plumbing, electrical, and handyman services uh, for all the machinery, the stores itself. And they're doing it not just here in Manitoba, but across Western Canada. If you need a one-stop shop for your kitchen, cooler supplies for your business, or a property in Western Canada, there's one place to call. That's Paramount Services Limited. You can ask for our guy, Carrie O., uh, or you can find out more online at ParamountServicesLTD.com. And they're always looking for qualified techs involving HVAC, plumbing, electrical, and handiwork. So you can go to your website, submit your resume today. And in case you're wondering, they are members of the Plumbers and Pipefitters Local Union 254. Certainly that's something I think prospective employees would like to know. ParamountServicesLTD.com. Big thanks to Paramount for their support of the program. Then I give a shout out to Not Auto Corp. I'm going to be heading out to the game tomorrow with the Not Gang. Very much looking forward to that game, but uh, also looking forward to getting out to that incredible showroom. If you've never been to see the Not Lot over there, they got the art gallery inside. It's been kind of quiet without people being in there. Now it's back open again, and you've got the incredible vehicles on the lot, the Teslas, and much more, and so much going on inside as well. I'll probably start it off there and maybe take the not bus over to the game tomorrow. Looking forward to that. Why not get into the vehicle of your dreams right now? Find out more, not Autocorp at Waverly and McGilvery, or you can check them out online at not.ca. They'll consign your present vehicle, a great service department with Red Seal technicians, detailing services, and so much more. Check them out at not at not.ca. And, uh, I have a feeling the BPs are going to be rocking tonight. we got CFL Week 2 getting going with Calgary and the Lions. Of course, a big bomber game tomorrow, a doubleheader on Saturday. What better place to get together with friends than your local Boston pizza? And you can check out the new summer menu. Bring your appetite. Sunglasses optional. The burger Italiano, the honey dill fried chicken sandwich, and the incredible cocktails, including the white sangria smash, the peachy mojito royale, galaxy fishbowl, and the bulldog margarita fishbowl. Bring your appetite. Summer's here at your local Boston pizza. Well, this is perfect that we had Brandon Rewicki set up. We were going to talk a number of Jets topics. We had Neil Pionk signing yesterday. And then the last 20 minutes, we hear that the summer of Chevy is just about complete with the signing of Andrew Kopp. Let's welcome in our good friend Brandon Rewicki, the host of the Skates and Plates podcast and regular contributor here on WST. What's going on, Brandon? How are you? I'm doing good, man. Yeah, I was all prepared and then, you know, tuned in to you. You dropped the bomb and now I'm all... I'm all out of it right here. So I, I, I kind of agree with your thoughts on this, but it's definitely, I, I like the commentator that, uh, or the commenter that said that, the the summer of Chevy. It, it might have finally come to an end, but there's no doubt that this was 2021 offseason was the summer of Chevy. Well, I, and I'll tell you what, great for him to be able to get this done right now and maybe actually spend a little bit of uh, downtime before things get going again very soon. Not sure whether that's realistic. I know there's lots of other things that happen, but... There were some pretty big things on Kevin Sheveldayoff's to-do list this offseason, and everyone has been ticked off, and maybe more than you know we could have imagined going in. Let's just start off with the Pionk deal before we got to what that meant for Andrew Kopp. Uh, what was your reaction when you heard that the Jets were able to sign him below $6 million on a four-year term? Yeah, I guess my initial reaction was pretty much what I tweeted out, which was, this is bizarrely fair. Like everyone's agreeing that, yeah, you know what? This this seems like a fair deal for both sides. Like, I don't think it was a an overpay or, you know, the, the agent took the GM to the cleaners. You know, I saw one of those um, analytical uh, Twitter accounts that kind of does the salary projection for each player. And I think they had it at four years, six million right on the dot. So, I mean, by the numbers, it was basically, I think, what was to be expected there. Uh, I, I like it. I, li- I like it a lot. I mean, as, as great as Neil Pionk is, I don't know if he wanted to go six or seven years either. And then, you know, the cap hit goes up as well. I think four years is is the sweet spot right there. And, and like you mentioned, to get it under $6 million, even though it's, you know, just by a hair, I think that's a nice bit of work from Chevy as well. And 
I guess the only intriguing part for me now that Neil Pionk has signed up semi long term, and it's something that I wonder and, and really would like to see going into this year is, you know, he's not the most highest paid D man on the team by a couple hundred K, but to me, he should be the most played defenseman this year. And we'll see if that's the case. We don't know what the D pairings are going to look like just yet, but to me, the Winnipeg Jets just signed their best defenseman from the past two years and their best defenseman going into the season as well. By the way, shout out to Paul Adet, who almost made me spit out the Diet Pepsi. He said, Brandon, hiding the hair today, LOL. Only available on pay-per-view now. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to the Jets defense core, though. Um, you know, we've spent so much time talking about the blue line. There was uncertainty about Neil Pionk. Josh Morrissey was essentially the only thing that was, you know, certain for long term. The Jets now go into next season with Morrissey signed for five more years, Nate Schmidt and Neil Pionk for four more years, and Brendan Dillon, Dylan DeMello signed for three more years, not to mention Logan Stanley for two more years, and will be an RFA at the end. And that is before we've even got to the Jets' top defensive prospects in Billy Hainala and Dylan Sandberg and Johnny Kovacevic down with the Moose. Uh, how did we get here, Brandon? I mean, the, the entire narrative and conversation about the Jets' defense core is taking a complete 180 over the last few weeks. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what Kevin Chevalier did looking at his decor, I mean, look, it's not going to be up there with the best, you know, whoever you think the best decor is in the NHL. I mean, Tampa Bay and, you know, Carolina when they had Dougie Hamilton. You can go, you know, up and down the rosters. The Jets don't have a number one stud defenseman. You know, that's just the, the fact of the matter. And I think, you know, as a GM, you have to take maybe a sobering approach to your roster and go, you know what, can we find that guy? Like, is he available without either, you know, plundering our assets and cap space or do they even want to come here? And I, I just think they realized that player wasn't going to be available to them. So the next best bet at that point is, you know what, let's let's try and load up on a bunch of not not great, but a bunch of really good defensemen, a bunch of second pair D-men. And, and you look at the roster right now, it's it's definitely not the best blue line in the NHL, but good is a massive step up from where they were before. And who knows? I mean, maybe maybe having three really good pairs, potentially three second pairs, you know, not a, a no doubt about a top pair, but three second pairs. You know what? Maybe, maybe that's good enough with possibly the best goaltender on the planet and a top 10 forward core in front of you. Like maybe that's good enough to make a deep run into the playoffs. So I, I, I just like, yeah, I really like the the approach that Kevin Chevalier took to all this. As well as, you know, as great as it is to have defensive prospects and to maybe have a path for them to get significant playing time at the NHL level, this isn't the year to do it, right? You can make the case they should have done it more last year, and I would agree with that. But with everything kind of on the line going into this season, you had to get, no doubt about it, two proven commodities to come here on the blue line. And and that's exactly what happened here. And on top of it, Brendan Dillon kind of... Um, Builds in the quota of what a lot of people think has been missing here for a long time. And that's, you know, let's get a mountain man in here and make things a little more difficult inside our own end. Having said that, though, I do think Jets fans are going to be pleasantly surprised at, at how nifty he is offensively. I think he's going to give the Jets a pretty nice boost there on the back end as well. Uh, Brandon Ruick is with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk discussing the uh, Winnipeg Jets offseason. Neil Pionk signed yesterday to a four-year deal. And today, Andrew Kopp on a one-year deal at 3.64. The Pionk news broke yesterday while we were on the air. Or maybe just before we came into the program. I can't remember. It's all a blur, Brandon. Um, <laughs> but as we talked about it and talked it through, and Marat was on the program yesterday, um, I couldn't help but think that the writing was on the wall that Andrew Kopp was going to be on a one-year deal. And historically, that is not somewhere where I think the Winnipeg Jets wanted to be or were comfortable being. Um, the cap issue was the cap issue. I mean, they had a limited amount of money to be able to sign Andrew Kopp. And you know, I speculated yesterday, I mean, I really think this is going to end up in a one-year deal and hopefully gets done before arbitration because I don't think anybody wants to go through that again. Uh, I was stunned that it happened so quickly. Um, but I think I think there probably was an acceptance on both sides of the cap situation of the Winnipeg Jets, the priority to address the blue line, and the fact that they knew Andrew Kopp had one more year at a relatively reasonable rate if they did go that route. Um, you don't like to lose players for nothing, and that's certainly a potential that that can happen at the end of the season. 
But my thinking was just he's too important to this team to trade for a couple picks or assets when if this team wants to win right now, you, you need number nine in the lineup. Yeah, and that's exactly my thinking on this. Maybe, like maybe before free agency started, you could have looked into potentially moving him and then it's okay. Can we find somebody to replace him for three and a half million dollars? I don't know how likely that was going to be anyways. And I think it's obviously exacerbated by the fact that Mason Appleton went to Seattle for nothing. And so, you know, maybe if Appleton was still on the roster, you could stomach trading Cobb just for draft picks and, and trying to maybe replace him internally. But like I said, with how crucial this upcoming season is, sometimes you just got to bite the bullet as an organization, right? I mean, it's, we, we don't even have to speculate. I don't think the Jets are going to lose Andrew Cobb for nothing. Next, He's going to walk into UFA. He's going to get more money than the Winnipeg Jets are, are willing or able to pay him and good for him. He deserves it, <laughs> right? Like he comes in as a, what was it? A third round pick and he's going to, find himself making, I don't know, $10, $15 million on his next deal. I think it's awesome. I'm happy for him, but I think there's a lot of similarity. He's almost like Zach Hyman light for the Jets, right? Like the Leafs went into last season knowing, look, would we like to have Zach Hyman back? For sure. But are we going to afford him? No, but he's too important to our team right now to just ship him out for nothing. And I think that's what the Winnipeg Jets found themselves in here. I can totally get the argument for trading him. But I just think there was there wasn't going to be anybody coming in to replace him. You just weren't going to find that. And there, even with Andrew Cobb in Winnipeg, there's still some questions to be solved with the bottom six. But at the very least, it makes it a lot easier that okay, now we only need one replacement as opposed to maybe two young guys stepping up. No, exactly. I mean, as far as the th like, think about the third line if Cobb's not here. You, you trade. Oh, we get the two second picks that you gave up for Brendan Dillon. We can get those back, and Andrew Cobb's gone. Well, that's great for the scouts and next year's draft and in three or four years down the road. But we've talked a lot about this window that the team has sort of set up for themselves right now over the course of the next three to four years with Hellebuck, the blue line, Shifley, Connor, Ehlers, Wheeler. I mean, this is the window for that group. And listen, I, I wouldn't say it's a hundred percent that cop is gone. I mean, I think that there would be a way that he could stay. Of course, Paul Stastny's on a one-year deal. His team will co go come off the books. And to me, the absolute wild card in all of this, Brandon, is Pierre-Luc Dubois. I mean, Pierre-Luc Dubois' Ooh. season last year did not go as many people expected. And I think he'll come in with a clean slate and a lot will be expected of him. Um, but he's on a contract that's going to pay him five million bucks he'll have arbitration rights at the end of the deal and this will be the time to sign him to a significant deal or you know potentially m move on him that's not a reality right now but i mean what happens if cole perfetti is available to kind of come in and begin playing that maybe you have some different options um but the bottom line is as we've discussed if this team wants to win this year andrew cop's going to be a part of it and the benefits of trading a player and getting back a young player or a prospect might be good organizationally, big picture, but you have to make some tough decisions and sometimes make some sacrifices when it comes to the opportunity to win right now. And it's very clear with the decisions and the moves that the Jets have made that, you know, they're not waiting. And if I'm Andrew Kopp, in some ways, like would I've loved to get, you know, six years at 5 million bucks? Well, sure. But, Man, what an opportunity to play on a really good team. He's coming off a quality a, a career year where he already had big point totals. Even if he doesn't put up points at the rate that he did last year, if the Winnipeg Jets win, if they go on a long playoff run, if people are able to see more and more about the value that Andrew Kopp gives to his team in so many different ways, from five on five play, penalty kill, contributing on the power play, he will be fine in the long run a year from now when he's able to pick where he goes in his next spot. Yeah, well, I, I mean, especially after he saw deals like the the Barkley Goudreau one with the Rangers, he's probably like, "Sweet, next year I'm getting at least four mil over six years. Maybe the Rangers will be dumb enough to give it to me, right?" Like he's gonna he's gonna cash it in a big way. I, I think you know from Andrew Cobb's perspective, this is a massive win win, right? Like there's really no downside to it whatsoever from his point of view. And hey, maybe, you know, no matter what happens this year, there's the chance that the Michigan boy maybe goes back home. And hey, why don't you sign it if Stevie Y comes up to him and He'll says, have the money. Yeah, we got the money. We got an A, maybe a C if you wanted to. And why don't you spend the next five, six years under my tutelage, right? So 
I, I think Andrew Cup is really, and, and hey, people don't like to hear it, but Andrew Cup and his agent have kind of played this one pretty well from just his personal point of view. But you're right. Like, there's just no other way to put it. We know how how it's basically all in, right? Like, I mean, I, I don't know what kind of jobs might be on the line, but, you know, it's not just make the playoffs anymore for the Winnipeg Jets. It's not just squeak in and be a bubble team. It's kind of, we got to clinch home ice. And I don't even know if winning a round is enough anymore, right? Like the, the stakes have been completely raised here. And, and there's a lot of players on the roster too. You mentioned like Dubois. I don't know if there's anybody on the team that has more pressure to perform than Pierre-Luc Dubois next season. And he's due for a big payday. So I, you, you would have to assume he's going to bring his A game this upcoming year. It's just, you know, and, and the other part of this too is I like that, you know, Kevin Shoveldayev has made these moves, you know, well ahead of, of training camp, like pretty early on in the summer in the off season. Because if you're, you know, name your guy on the Winnipeg Jets, you're jacked right now. Like you're jacked all summer long headed into training camp. There's a lot of good vibes going around everything like that, it, it does feel like, and hey, things can change pretty quickly here, but it does feel like there's a lot of positive momentum heading into the season here, and I'm excited to see where this goes, man, because it's there's some good teams in the Central, but there's a pretty good opportunity outside of Colorado for the Jets to, to really do some damage, and hey, maybe, I don't want to say breeze to a playoff spot, but have things looking pretty sexy come February. No, I I, uh, I I agree. And I think the vast majority of fans are feeling the same way. As far as cop goes, um, I said this to Remus, and I'm interested in your thoughts. I mean, from where I'm sitting, the only way Andrew Cop gets traded and does not finish the season with the Winnipeg Jets is if this season's a massive disappointment. I mean, if he's a player that's available in some sort of a trade at the deadline to help another team, that would be very bad news for what has per, um, happened up until that point. Are you sort of with me on that? It would be a disaster. It, it would be a disaster. Yeah, like at this point, you, you would trade him now if you were ever going to move him because at least you have time to, to try to find somebody to replace him. So, yeah, let's uh, let's hope Andrew Cobb's playing game one of the postseason, uh, or at least he's played the first game after the trade deadline here in Winnipeg because, that yeah, that would be bad. Even so, getting a couple picks for him would be bad. <laughs> so let's talk about the third line right now. Um, let's assume that it's Adam Lowry. Let's assume it's Andrew Kopp. Mason Appleton was the player selected by the Seattle Kraken. And we'll look forward to seeing what he can do on the West Coast. Uh, give me your power poll for candidates to go in and uh, take the tan of Appleton spot that has been so important for Paul Maurice and uh, running that line. Yeah, I, I to be honest, I don't have a favorite right now. Uh, I mean, I do, maybe if I had seen some off-season training videos from some of the young guys, I might be able to put somebody in there. But I, the answer is I don't know right now. Um, you know, Riley Nash maybe might be... I know everyone's going to pencil in Vesta Line or Harkins. I'm sure that's the, you know, the most... What about the um, Toninator? I don't, I don't know. I mean, we only we saw him so briefly here, and he was so damn good. So maybe, like, I, I don't want to say Toninato, but then he just had a good couple games to end the season, right? I, I don't know if the answer's there right now. I, and I think this is something that's probably going to go on as the season comes on here. You know, maybe if I, 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 I might lean towards Jansen Harkins, maybe. I know the team's been really high on him for a while. I mean, Christian Veselainen, you would hope at this point in his career, as a, you know, a former first-round pick, that he would have a top-nine spot solidified. But is it going to work with him beside Lowry and Cobb? Like, I don't know if that's the best spot for him to be in the lineup, that, that's the only that's the only fly in the ointment here is you have to try and find the right fit beside Lowry and Cop. I honestly I wouldn't be all that surprised if it was between Riley Nash and Jansen Harkins. And and Paul, we know Paul Maurice loves his vets. Um may, maybe Nash gets the the edge over Harkins right now, but I guess my answer is I don't have an answer. And I, I, I honestly don't know if the Jets do either. I'll say this about Jansen Harkins. Um, I'm not sure you'll see a more motivated player coming into training camp to show that he is ready to go right out of the gate because I think by any measure, last year had to be really disappointing for Harkins. I mean, he was a player from the season before that I think we all thought would be a regular in the lineup. I mean, it potentially was going to be, you know, fourth line. And I was a big advocate of Appleton and Appleton had a great season playing alongside Lopping, uh, Cop and Lowry, but he didn't get into very much action. And then at the end of the season, the reason why I bring up Ton and Addo, um, you know, after seeing him and being around it, he was the guy that got tabbed ahead of Harkins to be in the lineup and play at the beginning of the playoffs. And 
that wasn't a guy that was even on the radar. I joked that halfway through the season, not a single Jet fan would have been able to pick that guy out of a police lineup. <laughs> and yet there he is scoring a goal in game number one and being a big part of it. But Harkins in particular, I mean, this is a big put up year for him. I think the opportunity will be there with the other guys leaving that there will be a spot for him, but he's going to have to go and earn it. Yeah, I think there's a spot in, you know, the top 12 for, for Jansen Harkins where that's going to be, I don't know, just yet. And I, I mean, he's got the pedigree to do it, right? Like a second round pick. And I, I don't know how much more he has to prove at the AHL level right now. Like, it's just, you know, how much of an impact player can he be up with the big club right now? And, you know, it, it just wasn't a good year for for any of the youngsters last year, to be honest, up front, right? Like Veselainen and Harkins, what did they combine for? Like three points, right? Like they're as far as offense goes, there wasn't a whole lot there. I, it, it just it's it's really hard to get a sense of who's going to get the first crack and and really who deserves it. And that's not even to bring up David Gustafson potentially. I know he's a center, but you know if you're talking about guys that are defensively sound and, and solid, he's ready to go in, in that front. I don't know if the offense is going to be there right away, but at the very least, he's he's definitely a candidate moving forward. But there is a lot of motivation for all those guys, right? Like Paul Maurice is probably calling them. I don't know if he's doing the you know, the Kevin Weeks pregame speech. No. But okay, I wanted to bring that up with you. You obviously saw that. And for anyone, we didn't play it on the show. I don't want to DMCA, but I did retweet it yesterday. Maurice, uh, uh, Kevin Weeks' is Maurice impersonation. Uh, Unreal. I, I watched it 20 times yesterday. And, and, that, and that might be low. I mean, that... <laughs> That's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Like, can we can we get that just a regular segment of Kevin Weeks doing imitations of Paul Reese? Because it was because <laughs> it was so good. And what was it, so funny and interesting is that I think I mean Maurice is one of the all time great people speaking in front of the media. It's very clear that there's two sides to Paul Maurice, and the one that the, the players see is very different than the very buttoned up individual that. Um, does what he does in front of the microphone. I mean, that was just absolutely hysterical. I, I mean, it's pretty obvious when you hear players talk about him, right? Like they all, what did Blake Wheeler City go through a wall for him? All, like all these guys, the, the speeches, like that would be, I mean, I don't know if the Winnipeg Jets are ever going to get, like the Maple Leafs have whatever uh, series they have right now. I, uh, I don't it's think called we- all, all or Nothing, which Remus uh, Freudian Slip called it All for Nothing yesterday. All for nothing. <laughs> Yeah, like, and I don't think they're going to be on HBO anytime soon either, right? Like, I, the Jets just, you know, aren't a big draw that way. But wouldn't it be something to have Paul Maurice mic'd up just for, like, like a week? Get a week of pregame speeches and stuff like that. That Like, he is one of the all-time uh, – people here, you know, his detractors will point to, hey, he's the all-time losing his coach in NHL history. But he also might be the all-time biggest beauty as far as coaches in the NHL when it comes to pregame speeches and getting the players ready to go and stuff like that. And that impression is – we haven't heard a better one yet. <laughs> yeah. I, right? like, I, I haven't heard. I haven't heard too many Paul Maurice impressions, but that sets the bar like extremely high. Oh, it certainly does. Brandon Ruicki is with us. Uh, welcome to everyone that's joining us on YouTube. If you came at the regular time, a heads up: <clears throat> we started a half hour early today. Uh, Kevin Donnelly of True North Sports and Entertainment joined me. We talked about the rules to get into the the, the games. Uh, the double vaccination, all of that from the True North perspective. So if you missed that earlier, um, you can back it up on YouTube. You can catch it on the podcast a little later on. But if you're a Jet fan planning on going to games, certainly something that you will want to uh, want to check out. And if you're wondering, A, why did you guys go on at 1230 and why didn't I know about it? Very simple way to avoid that. Make sure you hit the bell uh, beside the subscribe button, you'll get a little notification on your phone when we are going live. Uh, because on busy days like this, with Neil Pionk speaking at one, Kevin Donnelly, we've got Matt Calvert coming up. We wanted to talk to Brandon. We're going to check in with Nick Kowalski and Hockey Manitoba. Uh, we didn't have enough time to do it. So occasionally we will go early. Make sure you've got the notifications on so you don't miss any Winnipeg sports talk. So, Brandon, everything has gone about as well as it could possibly have gone in the offseason. Everyone's fired up. So now um, people are looking for things to be worried about. And I look over to the chat and the new, the new topic of Jet fans is what's going to happen with the backup goaltending position. People are not sold on Eric Comrie. He's in on a one-year deal at $750,000. Um, 
I, I'll save my editorial for afterwards. Um, is Eric Comrie good enough? Are you concerned about this? Um, what do you make of the guy behind Connor Hellebach who will play the vast majority of the games in the Jets net? Yeah, well, I, I guess my initial reaction would be to try to find out what the over-under is on Connor Hellebuck starts this upcoming season and just absolutely hammer the over. Because <laughs> he, he, he might be making, I think Marty Verder had like 73 games one season. We might see Haley make a run at that. I think, I, Urbe, anyway, I think Urbe for Maurice one year played 79. Oh, maybe, oh, maybe it was, huh. Well, that's insanity. And it's funny that, <laughs> it's funny every that, game. that was Paul Maurice too, right? So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And I wonder if that was the year Kevin Weeks started one of the postseason games. Um, but I think it's a major question mark. How, how can it not be? Right? Like, as of right now, the two leading candidates for backup goalie are realistically two AHLers. Guys that have not gotten it done or haven't had the chance to get it done at the NHL level. And, you know, it, it didn't prove to be anything negative this past season. But I, I think goalies that start well over 60 games are overworked and, and are tired by the time the postseason rolls around. And I think we've seen their play suffer because of that. So, you know, it's unfortunate, I guess, first and foremost, that, you know, Connor Hellebuck is going to play 60-plus games this year. There's just no other way around it. Even if Eric Comrie comes in and blows everyone's expectations out of the water, Connor Hellebuck's going to play 60-plus games. And, and that, to me, is a big concern. But as far as is Eric Comrie the guy to hold down the mantle at the number two spot look if we're going off his nhl record so far the answer is a resounding no it's unfortunate but and he seems like the nicest kid in the world but he's not an nhl goalie based off the numbers that we've seen so far and, and so it's a major major leap by the jets to put their faith in eric Comrie right now but again hey we don't even know if they're doing that or maybe mikhail burden is the guy that's you know gonna get that slot heading into training camp here but I, I think it's a completely valid question mark going into the year. And it really is going to be that way, I don't know, till the new year rolls in. Yeah, um, uh, let me say this on Comrie. Um, I think everyone that has, is stamping him as a guy that can't get it done is being premature. I mean, we want to talk about all these stats. The guy has nine games in the National Hockey League. And I pointed this out the last time we had this topic of conversation. But folks... If you want to see how Eric Comrie was treated by his teammates, go watch the last couple games that he started for the Winnipeg Jets. I mean, the game in Colorado that he, uh, that he started at the end of the 2019 season, I'm pretty sure that was game 81 of the year. That was the buff smashing the stick over the penalty box. And I mean, the team was completely imploding at that time. It was one of the worst performances, and I've never felt worse for a guy, a young player coming into that opportunity, getting a chance to play, being hung out to dry by his teammates. I mean, it was brutal. And, uh, I mean, you can't, like, it, it, anyone, Connor Hellebuck is in that game. He's probably given up five or six. I mean, so we, we have, we talk a lot about sample sizes, and I'm all here for stats if we're talking about a few seasons. I mean, nine games over four years, to me, not enough to make any conclusions on Eric Comrie. So I'll just, I'll say that right off the bat. The other thing about it is, is that I, I'm also not saying that he's the guy that's going to go and get it done. I mean, to me, let's see. Um, we see it every year. There are other goaltenders out there that can come in and play, and they'll be on the waiver wire. And the fact that it's $750,000, it works within the cap space. And and now with the cop deal signed at 3.64, they will have a little bit more wiggle room maybe to... You know, if they do need to replace Comrie, if he goes to the minors, they're picking up a guy on waivers, maybe get up a little bit into the 1 million or 1.2. I haven't done the exact math. Um, but to me, like, this is not a huge, huge concern right now because, I mean, first of all, to your point, Connor Hellebuck is going to be the guy. He will be, I mean, the Jets will go as far as Connor Hellebuck takes them. But at the same time, if, you know, if Comrie, you know, does five or six starts and isn't up to snuff, I mean, I really do think there will be options for the Winnipeg Jets to get another guy that can come in and play 50 and odd games behind uh, behind Hellebuck. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing, too, is that <laughs> you can say, well, they should have brought in somebody more experienced. OK, well, who was going to sign here for a million and change? Right. Like none of those guys were available. Brassois, it would have been great for Brassois to come back, but he got a, a way bigger deal than I think any of us had anticipated. So, I mean, the options weren't there for the Jets. But again, having said that, I mean, God forbid, knock on wood, Connor Hellebuck misses some time with injury. Then things get really scary, right? It's just nice to have that safety net in place. And 
he just can't feel confident in it just yet. It would be a great story if Eric Comrie could get it done. Um, but honestly, if I had to put my money on it right now, I think Mikhail Burden is, is my guy, at least, to grab the number two spot out of training camp. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I'll say this about Burden. Um, I'm here for watching him play. I mean, you know, the guy is he's must-see TV. He's the most interesting goaltender I think we've seen before. He probably handles the puck better than half the guys that are forwards right now. So um, there'll certainly be some people that will want to see him. But again, the goaltending situation, it, it's great. I'll just finish with this, Brandon. What a world we are living in right now that at the end of this summer, Jeffel Dayoff will be able to go fishing for a week, got everything done, and the biggest topic on Winnipeg sports talk amongst nervous Jets fans is the backup goalie position. That That's the main thing right there, man. It's First not... world problems, bro. Yeah. <laughs> no more how can we find four NHL level defensemen? No, it's a backup goalie now. Thanks, gravy. <laughs> Um, hey, listen, dude, uh, before we go, fill people in on uh, what's going on on skates and plates and uh, what else you've got going on these days. Yeah, the big rig stop by, actually. That's going to be, uh, yeah, tomorrow's episode. Uh, Jim told Hair versus me. hair match. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we should, oh, man, I should have set that up. No no more TLC, just wig versus wig. Um, but, yeah, so, so you know, just had some fun talking with JT. Uh, that, that episode's coming out tomorrow. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, life isn't too great for me. It's it's diet time. I had a salad for lunch. I'm miserable. So I'll probably go <laughs> drink a coffee right now and just wallow in misery upstairs. Oh, buddy. Uh, well, hey, you know, just know that you got Rasmus Ristolain in there oh. on your blue line for the Flyers next year. And you know, just you can go to sleep knowing that that. <laughs> hey, listen, pal, thanks for doing this. Um, we'll look forward. Let's catch up on the weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for doing this as always. Sounds good. See you then, man. <laughs> right on. There's our old pal from the old station, Brandon Rewicki, joining us on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Been a wild show so far today. If you're just joining us, we started early today. We had Kevin Donnelly from True North Sports and Entertainment join us to break down what um, you're going to need to do to get in to watch the Winnipeg Jets and Moose this season. If you came in late, you can back that up at the start or you can catch the podcast later. Of course, we heard Neil Pionk's media um, address earlier today with the local Winnipeg media. Just had Brandon on. We're going to get to some CFL talk a little bit later on, and we have a very special guest coming up next. Uh, before we do that, I want to give a shout out to our friends at Little Brown Jug Brewing. Um, the incredible local brewers that'll bring in you the flagship brand 1919 available at your favorite bars and beer stores and a number of great new summer beers, including the summer lager and the Hefeweizen, which are available now in the good time summer variety pack. You can order it online at littlebrownjug.ca. If you do it by four o'clock, they'll deliver it to you same day here in Winnipeg. And if you haven't checked out their spot on William Avenue, Pop in, have a couple on the patio, grab a slice of pizza, and you can grab all the stock you want right there where it's made. Little Brown Jug on William Avenue. Check them out online as well and order at littlebrownjug.ca. Um, had a so-so day yesterday at the track at Assiniboia Downs. Having so much fun going head-to-head -head with Remus in our duel at the Downs. We'll have to wait until Monday for more live racing. In the meantime, though, you can play and bet around the world on the hpibet.com app. Um, but Assiniboi Downs is open every day. The VLT is open from 9 a.m. to 12.15. And incredible food from the chefs at the Terrace Dining Room available as well. But you do have to make reservations. You can find out more at asdowns.com or pop down and see them from 9 until 12.15 for VLTs and restaurant service. And, uh, of course, our friends at Breezy Bend. Uh, we were talking about Garth Collings and his incredible win in the senior championship, the uh, most decorated amateur golfer in Manitoba history. It is the home of the champions, great junior program, Braxton Kuntz with that amazing year, and the course is coming together with some big upgrades. They're just finishing up the sixth hole. If you're thinking about a spot for your family to golf next year, you can get on that waiting list. Talk to Corey Johnson today at Breezy Bend, or you can find out more at breezybend.ca. Speaking of golfing, our next guest now is going to have a little bit more time to do that, finishing up an amazing National Hockey League career. It is a pleasure to welcome in Manitoba's own Matt Calvert to uh, discuss the next chapter of his life. Matt, what's going on? Thanks so much for doing this. It's a pleasure to have you on Winnipeg Sports Talk. You bet. You mentioned golfing. Uh, I had back surgery two months ago, so I'm waiting nine months to do that. So I'm, I'm itching to get back on the course. 
Well, let me ask you right off the bat, how is your health? I mean, you did have some injuries, uh, you know, last season, which kept you out of the Avalanche lineup quite a bit. You announced your retirement after a great career. Uh, first things first, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. I, uh, I got a spinal fusion back surgery almost three months ago now. And uh, there's not a whole lot of movement after that. Um, unfortunately, I had to watch the boys play in playoffs and, and couldn't help out. But um, the body's hopefully on the road to recovery and, and just trying to get healthy again. Well, that's the first thing. I mean, you know, we realize, you know, people look at NHL players and realize how, uh, you know, blessed they are to be in the position. I mean, it's the best job in the world, I'm sure, as you would agree. But, you know, I mean, there is a lot that goes into it. I mean, it takes its toll. Um overall i mean was it just time uh or was it just the injuries last year i mean are you sort of planned that this was sort of the time frame for you or um you know was it just the fact that you know at some point your body tells you uh, it's time yeah it, it's i think it's different for every guy some guys you know don't have the passion anymore some guys slow down uh for me it was injuries it was uh, i was hoping to play two or three more years ideally I, I don't know if i wanted to be the guy playing past 35 if i physically could but um, you know, I had some concussions the last few years and, uh, I just don't know if I would have had it in me to quit. Cause once you get feeling good, you get another offer from whether it was the avalanche or another team, you, you just want to keep on going. And, um, and then I found out about my back, uh, I believe it was in March or April. And, uh, I was basically told not to play hockey again. So that, that was a tough pill to swallow. I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, and just trying to figure out what life has for me next. Yeah, well, I mean, you'll have a little bit of time to do that. And I guess, unfortunately, without the uh, the golfing going on for the next few months, uh, lots of time to do that. Well, let's back up. Uh, a Brandon native played, you know, just very briefly in the Manitoba Junior Hockey League and then went into the Brandon Wheat Kings for three amazing seasons. Um, give us a bit of a, tell us about Matt Calvert as a branded kid growing up. And, uh, then of course, playing with the Wheaties, which I'm sure was a dream for you growing up in that town, just like uh, it would be to play in the national hockey league eventually. Yeah. I, uh, I was born and raised in Brandon, Manitoba and then played my minor hockey. Um, I always thought I was a decent player, but I was five feet tall and <laughs> when everyone else was about five, nine or above. And, uh, I ended up playing three years in the Manitoba triple A midget hockey league. Um, which was kind of rare. Uh, I thought I might have had a chance at the Weekings at 17. I broke my wrist in camp, went back to midget, and we ended up winning it. Um, always growing up hating Winnipeg hockey teams, by the way. I will put that out there right now. <laughs> and uh, and then I, I was fortunate enough, I was a walk-on. I was actually thinking about going the NCAA road, and then Kelly McCrimmon called me in and gave me an extra year of schooling to come to Brandon. And I just said, why not get a play in your hometown? And I walked on at 18 years old and was fortunate enough to play with Braden Shen from day one and Scott Glenny and uh, two amazing junior line mates and um, got drafted that same year. And to tell you the truth, I, I knew what the NHL draft was, but I just never thought it would be on my radar. And about eight months later, I was, uh, you know, ranked in the final central scouting rankings and drafted to Columbus. And uh, three years later, I played my first NHL game. So it, it happened pretty, pretty quickly in my late teens. The draft is it's changed and grown over the course of the years. And I mean, obviously the last couple of years has been really tough for the young men that are hearing their name, not being able to be a part of it. But uh, tell us about draft day for you. Did you go to it? Uh, were you doing something else and just got a phone call? How dialed in were you on what was happening when the uh, names were going off the board? Yeah, it was an interesting day for me because like I said, I played triple A hockey at 17 year before. So I was kind of a no one, but I had a good year in the WHL and, I got invited to the NHL Combine. That was actually my my first ever flight I'd been on. And basically, you know, I'd been out of Brandon a few times, but never never flown. And I had to fly by myself. And and I think the final rankings, I was ranked 23rd in North America. So pretty high. But I show up at the Combine with uh, seven interviews. And usually guys that are ranked that high, anyone had from like 15 to 25 interviews with teams. So I, I was an interesting story. And, uh, and then draft day, um, you know, they said I could have been a second, third rounder. And I decided to stay at home in Brandon with my family and we were watching and I totally expected not even to get drafted. And uh, finally the fifth round rolled around and I, I actually saw them put my name up beside the Columbus Blue Jackets at 127 overall. And uh, man, what a, what a moment. Cause you know, the media puts expectations on you get drafted and uh, you know, there's stories written about you before. And as the rounds dwindle down to the seventh round, you're just like, you're like, I just hope I go at this point. And uh, it, it was a nerve wracking day, but uh, I got a party with my family after and, you know, enjoy it like a true Manitoban would. 
Well, and, and then of course you go back to the Wheat Kings for a couple more seasons um, and, 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 you know, continue to grow. How important for preparing you for the National Hockey League was playing those extra seasons in junior hockey with the Wheaties? Yeah, my, my 19 year old year was big. Um, I started gaining some confidence, went to my first NHL training camp. You just, you come back and you see those guys and you see that level you have to get to and you just, you want to get that much better. And um, my 20 year old year was interesting. Since I started junior so late, um, I actually went to Columbus Blue Jackets training camp and, and had a, a real great tournament at Traverse City, went into main camp, did well in exhibition and Ken Hitch, Hitchcock was our coach at the time. And um, we were hosting Memorial Cup and like I had my heart set on going back for Mem Cup and uh, but I played good enough and Ken basically brought me in and said, you know, I've been in the WHL, I get it, you want to go home for the Mem Cup, but uh, he's like, you might be one of the first call ups and I just I followed my heart. I had to come home. I had to take a chance at winning that thing. And especially in front of the home fans. And uh, I, I don't regret it for a second. Cause I, I got a blossom that year. We, we had such a good hockey team and, and I got to play with some great players. You got, you kind of got to be the man for one year as a 20 year old. And um, I had a, had a lot of fun and, you know, there's, there's no rush to turn pro and uh, ended up turning next year as a 21 year old. And uh, you know, and I definitely don't regret that decision. Just allowed me to develop that much more. Well, and you were ready to go. I mean, you know, many players, you know, when they come out, they'll spend a year or two in the American Hockey League. I mean, you really split that time in Springfield and Columbus that first year. And I mean, uh, then played 42 games. I mean, tell us about game number one. What do you remember? Where was it? Was the family there? And uh, you still uh, you still get a smile thinking about that first time you got to put on that jersey and play. Yeah, it, it was kind of a wild ride. I was in Springfield, Massachusetts, so on um fully on the East coast. And my first game was in Anaheim. So I, I think I had a connecting flight. I flew all day the day before I got in late that night, morning skate the next morning, and then you're playing. And I, I think I took a penalty. I don't know what it was. First period. I think I high stick the old Winnipeg Jets legend, Timu Solani there. And I was just sitting in the box and I'm just like, do not, do not score. They didn't score in the power play. So that was a great feeling, but I, I think I felt a little more comfortable and felt a little more real in my second game in LA. I ended up losing, but I scored my first goal, which was, I think I'll be telling my grandkids it went bar down, but it was, it was probably one of the worst NHL goals and in, goals in, in history. And, uh, that, that's kind of when I really, really felt like, wow, I'm in the NHL. And, and I just kept building after that. And, uh, man, it was a lot of fun because at that point, when you're 21 years old, you're playing your childhood heroes still. And, uh, with Columbus being in the Western conference, we were in division with Detroit Red Wings who were. Pavel Datsuk, Henrik Zetterberg, and and guys I really looked up to in junior and just w were amazed by. And and now all of a sudden I had to play against them and, and penalty kill against them, which was uh, talk about getting thrown into the fire right there. Um, I have to ask you, I mean, we've talked to Paul Maurice every time a guy comes in and, you know, gets his first NHL game. Maurice talks about giving him the speech and, you know, nobody has the experience of Paul Maurice. He's done many of those. But uh, our old pal Arnie, Scott Arneal, of course, was the coach that year with the Blue Jackets. Uh, do you remember, uh, did you get a speech from Scott Arneal before uh, going out there for game number one? I think a little bit. He he always paid a little extra attention to me because he obviously was coaching the Moose before and, and Manitoba boy, and he knew Kelly McCrim and had a scouting report of me. But, uh, you know, I, I don't remember it vividly, but I, I do remember him talking to me and being being happy for me and, uh, you know, obviously having that opportunity to make my childhood dream come true. Matt Calvert is with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk discussing his uh, 566 games in the National Hockey League, another 32 in the playoffs. Um, the the second year, 11-12, was, of course, a special um, year for hockey here in Manitoba as the, the Jets returned. I have to ask you, Matt, and I don't recall this, but... Were you in? Did you play in the first exhibition game back here? It was that split squad game between the Jets and the Blue Jackets with the infamous first shift um, that felt like a playoff atmosphere here in uh, here in Winnipeg. Oh, it's it's funny you ask that because I was the start of the infamous first shift. I uh, I was left wing and uh, Chris Russell. I think we won the draw, and uh, and. I, I don't know if I fell off the draw, but I got turned around. So as a winger, you want to get opened up in the neutral zone. When you got, got a guy like Big Buff on the blue line, you, you want to know where he's coming, right? Well, I didn't have that chance. So I, I turned the ops away. My blind side was the buff. Chris Russell gets the puck. I forget who your winger was, but they're, they're, they're running at him. He just threw a suicide pass to me. I see it coming. I take one look over my shoulder and that's Big Buff. And I, I was the I was the first hit in the building of the first game uh, that started that 
that crazy shift. And then a few of my line mates were a couple fighters. Uh, I can't remember the names right now, but, and then it just was, uh, it, it was crazy. It was, uh, and I get reminded of that constantly by mostly all my Winnipeg friends. You remember that first game back in Winnipeg? And yeah, it was, it, that guy's like hitting the brick wall right there. Yeah. I think Cody Bass was in there was, uh, was yeah. one of the guys that were in Toronto. With Dane, either... Dane Byers maybe was the other <laughs> yeah. name. Yeah, It was, that must've been, I mean, I can remember being in, in the building and just as, you know, a Winnipeg sports fan and someone that, you know, had been going to the games before, remember the team leaving the excitement of, just the return of the Jets was something that I think anyone in this province will will always remember. But being in that building, I mean, for you as a guy that grew up in Brandon, being rivals with the Winnipeg teams, but obviously being a Manitoban, I, what was it like just coming out at the beginning? I mean, you played in preseason games before. Usually they're dull. The buildings are half full, if that. And you go out into what really did feel like a Stanley Cup playoff atmosphere for a bloody split squad game. It, it was amazing. I, like I, I've always, I've always been a guy that's come home this summer. I always love playing in front of the home crowd, and um, you know, I, I had friends and family there every time I got to come. But what a, what an atmosphere! Like you said, preseason games can be absolute snoozers, not full lineups, more HL guys, and um, man, what a, what a blast that was for a preseason game. And it just, it, it just helped you that much more. But I, I know after seeing that first shift, everyone was like wow, you know, sometimes you can float your way through a preseason game. This was this was not the case that night. It was like, keep your head up. You're basically in playoff hockey right when you're coming out of summer hockey mode. So it, it, it was uh, it was pretty awesome to be a part it's of. It was like this September 12. Guys have had three <laughs> days of camp and getting thrown into that. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a night that we'll remember fondly for, for a long, long time. And it's very cool that you were, uh, you were a part of it. Um, how did you like playing in Columbus? I liked Columbus a lot. You know what? It was a good transition for me. Being a guy from Brandon, a city of what, 45,000 growing up, it, uh, I was very green. Like I said, I was never on a flight. Uh, the biggest city I'd been to was Winnipeg or maybe Edmonton, I guess, at, at one point. And uh, going to Columbus, it, it's a it's a bigger city population-wise, surrounding area, but it's got a small feel. And I, I guess before Columbus, I was out in Massachusetts, and that was a, that was a bit of a wake-up call. But I'd say an easy transition city for me, but honestly, those, those fans are awesome. We had, we had so many average years where we were any, anywhere from 20th to 30th ranked in the league and, and they were supportive. They, you know, they're not like Canadian hockey fans where, you know, they want to turn on you and they expect wins. They, they were more, more of like football fans. And when playoffs rolled around, it was, it was awesome. They, they would finally pack the building, but Ohio state university football is the big draw there for, for a lot of those winter months. And, once that's done in January, whatever the month is, that then we started to see fans come to the stands. But uh, great setup. They got their practice rink attached to the rink. Um, living, whether you're young, you have Ohio State University five minutes down the road. If you're a family, it's, it's great for living. It just, I, I think a lot of times it gets a bad rap around the league because they haven't been successful in their history. Um, but no, what, what, a great, uh, what a great city and what a great organization to play for. Uh, Matt Calvert with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. How did you enjoy playing for Torts? What was he like? Uh, Torts was good. Uh, Torts is a roller coaster. He, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny when I when he was my coach in Columbus, I'd come back in the summer, and I swear to God, everyone you saw, it wasn't how was your year. It was how was Torts. It was how was Torts, and it was just it was constant because everyone sees them on TV and they they want the backstories. And man, there's some funny stories that you you gather when you play for him for a few years, but. Uh, the, the one thing about him is the one goal he has every day is winning. And obviously that's everyone, but he really wants to win. And, um, you know, the, the saying on the, in the room before you go out, uh, and I guess I can't swear on this, but it, it's don't F it up. And, and that, and that's, that's the last thing you see as a player from your coach's message. And, <laughs> and so he, he puts that, he, he does put that pressure on you. I love it because you go to training camp, the hardest training camps I've ever been a part of. I mean, like you're doing two mile runs and 35 degree heat with crazy humidity because you're in the Midwest in the United States and uh, you're skating 20 plus laps a day after practice. It's it's hell. Training camp is hell with him. But I will say by game one, your team's ready to play. Um, and uh, he demands a lot of the guys. Uh, and, and I think the longer you play for him, the more you you respect. And, and I got to talk to Torts a bit after you get out of that player coach relationship and uh, you know, he'll do anything for anyone. I have a few teammates that needed some, you know, some uh, letters written. They're trying to get jobs with another organization and he's the first guy to offer it. So, um, you know, I think once you get past that point 
of the player coach, which you're not always going to love your coaches. Um, you know, he, he's a, he's a great guy. And I know he was very well respected by his assistant coaches as well. Cause he, he just, he let them grow and he let them do a lot. Like Brad Larson's taken over in Columbus. Now he, he really let Brad the last few years get that feel for being a head coach and moving on to that next step in his coaching career. Do you ever remember any incident in particular of getting on the wrong side of one John Tortorella? <laughs> Uh, yes. You know what? Me and Tort's an interesting relationship. I think he appreciated my work ethic, so he didn't bother me too much, but I got one funny story. I won't open up too much, but uh, in playoffs, I, I, I always consider myself a playoff guy. I just, uh, you know, mentally you got an 82 game season, you know, you're, you're a role player, you know, there's, there's probably going to be ups and downs. It's going to be ups and downs for everyone. But with the seven game series, I could really wrap my, my mind around, be my best every night. And, he comes in after game two. I think we were playing, I don't know if we were playing Washington or Pittsburgh. I think it was Washington the last year I was there. And he comes in and he looks around the room. He, he goes, Matt Calvert's our best forward. And I start laughing. He's like, he's like, Matty, F and Calvert's our best forward. He's like, there's no way you should be our best forward. And I'm just like, I'm like, thanks, Torres. I'm like, yeah, I'm really trying to, you know, really trying to help the team out. Thanks for putting it that way. Not saying, hey, our third line's doing a great job. Hey, how about our first and second line wake up? It's just Matt Calvert's our best forward. Holy smokes, guys. <laughs> Holy smokes. Walk around the rope. And I'm just like, that's that's the stuff with torts. It's like sometimes I don't, you know, I don't think he has a filter. And uh, you know, stuff like that might rub you the wrong way. But he says a lot of funny stuff. And then, you know, I'll give you one more tidbit. He he always has his glasses on when he's doing video. And then our video coach, great guy, his name is Dan in, in Columbus. Every day, he asked how to use that fast forward rewind button. Every single day, I swear to God, couldn't learn it after one. Danny, how do I use this fast forward rewind button? God damn, like, can't you get this dialed in? Every single day for three years, I saw this guy on this, ask the same question. And it's just, you could write a book on torts of the, the stuff he says and the things that go on. And it would be, it would be hilarious. I, I'm sure, I'm sure a group of players will do that someday, but all in all, he wants to win. I want to win. And that's, and that's the main goal. Matt Calvert with us. Um, tell us about signing with Colorado. I mean, what an opportunity to go to a team that had been through some tough times, but man, there was a lot of young talent on the squad that you were with for the last three seasons. Yeah, actually uh, a guy you guys had with the Jets, uh, Mark Latestu. Um, he, he once told me just in passing, I think we were out for dinner. He said, Calvi, if you want to win, he said, fall around the superstars. And, you know, I, I lost out the three playoff years in Columbus. We lost out to Sidney Crosby, Sidney Crosby, Alex Ovechkin. And, you know, at times when we were playing Pittsburgh, I, I was, you know, we were out playing them most of the series as Columbus. We, we had like a solid team, the, especially the, the second year we played them. And they would just go down and score, go down and score. Just, you know, they, they had the finishers. They had the high-end skill. And... I, uh, I, I had a chance to do the, the whole fly down and visit a couple different teams. And then the big thing that sold me, one, Denver is an awesome city. But the biggest thing was the management, which was Joe Sackick. Um, great guy. Went out, went for dinner with him and his wife. Chris McFarland, assistant GM. He was, he was one of the guys that drafted me in Columbus. Another awesome guy. And then Jared Bednar and uh, Nolan Pratt were the coaches at the time. Uh, still are. Um, but they were my coaches in the minor league. So a lot of familiarity. Um, but just the way these guys present themselves, it's, uh, you know, you're a pro hockey player. You, you should be expected to work your butt off in the summer, show up to camp, ready to go and have your best year every year. But these guys just it had such a relaxed atmosphere. And then when I got to the team, you got the Nathan McKinnons, the Gabriel Aniscogs, Miko Rantons, the, now the Kale McCars. You, you had the studs, but it worked out in such a way that the management was so relaxed and expect you to do your job and respected you. And then you have the Nathan McKinnons in the room pushing you to be the best you can be as, as a, a player leader. And, and it just, it, it was just such a good mix. And it, it was so exciting to play with those guys. I was, I was 29 years old. I think my first year there. And by the end of the year, Nathan McKinnon had me, me wanting to become a better hockey player. A lot of times when you're 29, 30 years old, you're, I, I don't want to use the word coasting because you, you got to fight like hell to stay in this league, but you, you almost, you are who you are and you, you know, you accept that role. For me, it was like, I want to get better. I want to get better. Cause I saw this guy every day and the things he did. And, and I was just like, you know, 
why can't I even move an inch closer to Nathan McKinnon? Why can't I up my game too? And he pushed me to do that. And I ended up having my best year points wise as, as a 30 year old, my second year in, in Colorado. And, um, just being around those high level guys, it's, uh, it was probably one of my first times in my career and it was just, uh, it, it rubs off on you. It was awesome. Well, and it's funny you bring up McKinnon because there was a report last week of sort of just how driven he is. I mean, what was the story with the pizza in the locker room? He says, is he ordering the cauliflower crust for everybody? <laughs> Yeah. You know what? A lot, a lot of that is true on like, you know, treating your body the best you can be. When I was in Columbus, we would have a practice and then we would go to catch a plane and we would go, you know, there was a group of us, excuse me, Scott Hardnell, Cam Atkinson, Brand Dubinsky, Ryan Johansson, when he was there, and we'd go to eat and burger, a couple beers, board the plane, you know, maybe, you know, maybe go at night, maybe not eat health, not think about nutrition. Um, some guys are blessed with good metabolism. Some are, and I was one that was blessed with it. So I didn't have to worry about it, but I, I got to Colorado and we went to a, I went to a fantasy football draft. I was just starting to get to know the guys. Everyone orders, they go Turkey burger, no bun and sweet potato fries. And here I'm sitting with a che- double cheeseburger and a couple of beers in front of me. And I'm like, I'm like, you guys eat like this. And as I got to know Nate and I got to know Nate real well and the, the guy that released all this news is Nikita Zadorov, and it, I love Z. Z is a good guy, but he, he likes he likes the media and he likes to give stories. and And the thing with Nate is, uh, man, like like I said before, that guy wants to win bad, and he he wants all his teammates. We we were eating chickpea pasta. It was said in the reports that's he had the whole team convert to chickpea pasta. I didn't even know what chickpea pasta was. I had no idea. Um, you know, he was all over me for you know what I was eating. Do I stretch and do I warm up for games? I, I barely did that in my career. Maybe that's why I'm 31 and retired. But um, I, I started, you know, I, I started understanding why he's so great every night. And he is so committed. And my second year, I'll give you a little, a little story that Nate pushed on me. Nate was dairy free. I never even thought of going dairy free in my life. Like not, not even a thought for me. And he said, try it out. So I actually committed to it for six weeks. Probably the best six weeks of hockey I've ever played in the NHL regular season. And I just had energy every night and I was, you know, I was kind of watching him every night. I'm like, how does he do it every night? Well, it's treatment. It's, it's nutrition. It's working hard in the summer, taking care of your body recovery after he does it all. And he he's committed to winning. And that's why I truly believe that team is, you know, is whether they're win next year or the next few years that they're, they're going to get it done. No, well, I can tell you what, with the Jets going back to the Central Division and what they've done in the offseason, knowing that the Avalanche are still there in the division, cannot wait to see some of those games coming up when uh, we get to get back to the arena downtown and uh, and see the, the team play again. Matt, this has been so much fun. I've got to ask you, I mean, uh, now you've officially retired. You're recovering from the back surgery, so the golf game's on hold for a little bit. Um, What's next for you? Um, Have you thought about much about life after hockey? And uh, oh, what, what's in your what's in the plans? Yeah, I've thought lots about it. Um, I said, you know, I'm going to take a year off in rehab and a month later I'm bored. Uh, I got, uh, I got a three and a five year old, two boys, three and five. And, uh, they got crazy amount of energy. My, my five year old who was then four started hockey last year, and then he'll be going into the Tim bits hockey program and Brandon here this year. And so I'll, I'll start with him. And, and one big emphasis for me is, is being around for them. I, I've obviously traveled last five years since they've been around and last 11 years in the league. And I, I want to be there. I want to be able to coach my kids, you know, or at least watch them as much as I can, but I'll definitely be staying in the hockey world. I'm working on a few things right now and hopefully be involved in hockey and Brandon, um, whether it's we Kings or w- with the under 18 program. Um, and then also uh, I, I might get into a little bit of consulting uh, with uh, my former financial company, Cardinal Capital Management out of Winnipeg there. And just, more as a recruiter and uh, and then might team up with uh, an agency as well and just try to help kids make right decisions when they're coming up. At, I mean, they're recruiting them at like 13, 14, 15 years old now, which is crazy. Um, I definitely don't want to be that guy out at ranks and, and doing all that fun stuff. But um, but it's just so many parents are worried about, you know, what's the best route for for little Johnny? What, what can we do? You know, should we have an agent now then? And and I think it's good to have a guy that's been through it, um, you know, and and I have a lot of connections of guys that, you know, have gone into the NHL and lost everything they've had. Um, guys that have been burnt by agents or, or picked the wrong one. And um, I think when you can talk to a former player about it, it just, it it helps ease that decision for these parents because a lot of them, I'll, I'll tell you right now, when, when I was 18 years old, I got an agent two months before the draft 
Um, and I never had one before that. And my parents knew nothing about it because they weren't hockey people. So it's always good to have someone to talk to, you know, instead of just a bunch of agents coming or financial guys. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to help out in, in, in that side of things and, uh, you know, just focus on rehabbing and, and work my way in and see what I want to do next. Well, I, I have to thank you for coming on. I mean, it, it's always been fun. I mean, you know, being a Winnipeg guy in this business, we've always paid close attention. You were kind enough to join us on uh, the old station a couple times. But I will tell you, now that you've got some time and you're kicking it around in Brandon, uh, if you ever want to come on and talk hockey with us, we would love to do that once we get into the season. So um, this has just been so much fun. Everyone with us live here has been absolutely loving it. And uh, we wish you nothing but the best, Matt. We congratulate you on a great career. And uh, I hope we can do this again sometime once the season starts here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. You bet. Call me anytime. Maybe I'll drive in and uh, take in a game too. You just have to give me some tickets. <laughs> done deal. Done deal. Um, hey, thanks so much for doing this. All the best. Uh, continued uh, success with the recovery. Have fun with the kids. And uh, again, congratulations on a great career. Made a lot of Manitobans proud, especially in your hometown of Brandon. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Great stuff. There's Matt Calvert. What an awesome conversation that was. Um, he, uh, you know, we'd had Matt on a couple times during the course of his career. But, and this is one of the reasons why I love this format so much. And again, if you're listening on the podcast, um, it, it the fact that we're doing this on YouTube the way we are and being able to see people, I mean, it, it's the closest thing to having the in-person interviews that we used to do, which, you know, it was, it was just so much different than having someone in studio than just talking to them on the phone. And um, man, the energy Matt Calvert still has, the stories that he had, that was... Um, that was phenomenal. Thanks very much. And uh, Joe Caligiuri is agent who helped us set that up. And great work for Michael Remus to uh, to get that done. Um, we, uh, we've got lots still to get to. Uh, we got CFL week two beginning tonight. And um, and it's funny, a little bit later on, we, we do want to bring in uh, Bernie Reichardt from Hockey Manitoba. Kind of funny that we had Matt Calvert on. We'll ask Bernie about uh, you know his impact on the Hockey Manitoba. But things are getting going on uh, the hockey scene. So we'll find out what's going on with Hockey Manitoba a little bit later on. But coming off a lot of hockey talk so far, we do want to get into football. And our next guest is a good friend of our show, a former TSN 1290 intern that has somehow turned into one of the sharpest individuals when it comes to talking CFL football, picking lines and having fun when we're getting to uh, the bets. And just before we do that, uh, we've got the line up right now for at Cool Bet for the uh, Calgary BC game tonight. I believe we're still at seven. Yeah, seven points. I think it opened at six and a half. Uh, still waiting. We probably won't get the Bomber Argo line officially until tomorrow. Uh, Elks Alouettes, Ty Cats Rough Riders. But any of you that jumped on the Lock Shop Boosted Odds Partner Parlay, we are in business, folks. The Brewers put up seven in the first inning. They cruised. It was 10 nothing, And then that fifth inning and our first five bet for the Jays came through last night. So we have got a plus 300 money line ticket on the Elks on the weekend. Uh, hedging's for gardeners. I don't think I'll go the other way. But let's talk about all the CFL action and uh, get some insight from Nick and his picks. Nick Kowalski joins us now on the program here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Nick, what's up, pal? It's great to have you on the show. Nick, can you hear us? He cannot hear us, apparently. Hmm. That's an issue. Yeah, um, Hustler, nice seeing you again. Uh, I know it's been a little while. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you guys. Yeah. Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, welcome yeah, in. Uh, it, okay, perfect, perfect, man. Great to have you on the program. Um, Hey, first off, before we even talk about the action, um. How fired up were you, as so many of us were, to finally have sports in general coming back, but seeing that full stadium last Thursday here in Winnipeg as uh, the CFL was back and the hometown Bombers kicked ass in uh, the uh, the first game in that Grey Cup rematch? Oh, it was incredible being back, Hustler. And I know um, a, lo a lot of people were excited to be back at the stadium there. And um, I was lucky enough to be actually on the field for the game. Um, um, and um, it was a pretty incredible experience. I know a lot of the fans went home happy. And uh, it was a pretty great time uh, being back there. 
You know what? Nick, do us a favor. I think we've got a big delay right now. Just go out, click out, and then come back in. And uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit less of a delay right now because uh, I know I can see it's sort of rattling you when we do the questions. We have this we long do. pause. So, yeah, so just pop out and then come back in. We'll get to it, and it should be a heck of a lot better. As I mentioned, BC, seven-point underdogs tonight against the Calgary Stampeders, an over-under of 47 and uh, the money line, if you like the rookie quarterback, Nathan Rourke, plus 225 for the British Columbia Lions. Other games this week, tomorrow, we'll be talking a lot about it. Ed Tate's going to join us tomorrow on the program, uh, as is Desiree Scott. I've been mentioning that all week. So excited to have our gold medalist on the program. But Bombers Argos tomorrow night, 730. Uh, then 6 o'clock, uh, Alouettes Elks on Saturday. And the late game, 9 o'clock from Mosaic Stadium the Ticats, and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. All right, I think we've got Nick back. This uh, should hopefully be quite a bit better. Um, Nick, thoughts on, uh, before we get to this week's games, uh, just the performance of the Bombers. Uh, we got the good feelings out of the way. What a great night that was. How about the how about the performance of the Blue Bombers and what they were able to do? Oh, we just dropped out. Now we've got Bernie rolling in here too, man. Everything's happening at the same time here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. So we'll uh, hopefully we'll get Nick back in here in a second. Um, and you can follow Nick on Twitter at Nick with a K, Nick Kowalski. Um, does a great job firing up um, picks going on forward. Nick, we got you back here. Let me ask you about the uh, about the game itself. Um, performance of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Um, six points to the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Hard to imagine the season going much better for the Blue and Gold right off the hop. You know what, Hustler? Um, after that first drive there, there was, what, the quick pass to Brandon Banks, followed up by that 37-yarder to Jalen Acklin. I... I kind of thought Hamilton was going to uh, take that game on Thursday. And when that Ackland touchdown happened against uh, the boundary side rookies on the Bombers defense there, I thought Winnipeg was in for a long night. Um, but then Zach Calero showed up. Uh, the the offensive line, defensive line showed up. And they played fantastic from there on out. Like holding Hamilton to un under 300 yards of total offense, that's an incredible feat to have. And um and just combine that with Caleros taking care of the football, scrambling around, finding open guys. And Winnipeg looked like they are a real stout team this season. And I expect them to continue their winning ways uh, moving forward. Uh, what are the takeaways for the Ticats? I mean, we'll get to the Ticats Riders game uh, to complete the uh, the four games on the weekend. Um, were you surprised that they weren't able to do more against the Bomber defense? Or uh, maybe is that just, you know, a, a nod to especially the front of the Bombers, the ability to put pressure on Jeremiah Masoli and some newcomers, as you mentioned, stepping up in their first game in three down football? You know what? I think it's both. Like Hamilton really struggled to find any offense outside of Acklin and Brandon Banks that game. And one thing I was surprised they didn't utilize more was the return of Sean uh, Sean Thomas Erlington. It was he played a couple games last year before going down with the knee injury, and um, before then he looked like he was on pace to become the, arguably maybe the next Andrew Harris. And he only had about I think it was eleven touches the whole game. And I know he had under fifty yards. And I thought that when you have a playmaker as dynamic as him, you have to give him the ball and find ways to make him open. But with that said, Winnipeg's front, uh, they terrorized that game. I thought Jackson Jeffcoat was the best player on the Bombers' defense last week. He was all over Mazzoli's face. He was beating his guys one-on-one -on -one, uh, all night. And then there's obviously Willie Jefferson doing his thing. Adam Bighill, I thought, was very impressive in that game, too. Uh, Brandon Alexander, again, at the, at the back end there, I thought was fantastic, too. So I think it was more so a combination of Winnipeg, having a real good game plan for the Thai Cats, and then Hamilton also missing uh, two of their star guys, too, and Devere Posey and Braylon Addison, who they're still without. Yeah, so, I mean, a great start for the Bombers. We joked that the TSN turning point of the game was the two-point convert because it was lights out for the Thai Cat offense after that. But I'm very interested to see what we get from Hamilton coming up later on. Let's talk about this game tonight. Uh, BC rookie quarterback Nathan Rourke, who... You know, got some experience the hard way. Probably don't want to go down 31 nothing to start off a game, but there he was at the end in the fourth quarter throwing a touchdown pass. Um, so BC, I mean, I don't really know what we can take out of that game. It was so bizarre. Calgary, for their part, still looks like a work in progress, but unlike a lot of people, I'm not out on the stamps. I think their body of work, the fact that they've been winning a winning team in the CFL since 2007, 
bodes well for their ability to turn around, especially with Bo Levi Mitchell. Uh, this game looks like it's a seven-point spread right now. Uh, what do you think about tonight's opener to Week 2? I think the spread is pretty accurate, right? You have Nathan Rourke going into Calgary as a rookie quarterback. We still don't know exactly what BC's offense is going to look like, although I do like their supporting cast. I think you could argue they might have the best receiver group in the entire CFL. Um, I myself, I'm not too high on the Stampeders, but I do agree with you. Uh, they're compared to the New England Patriots uh, for a reason with their Bo Levi Mitchell and before John Hoffnagel and now uh, Dave Dickinson at the helm. Um, they just find ways to win, right? But one thing I do like in this game is the under for the points. I do like, I really like BC's offense and combined, I mean, a BC's defense, sorry, and combined with Nathan Rourke starting for uh, BC and Calgary having a decent defense of their own. I, I really think that the line I'm seeing right now is 48 and a half of the total. And right now I would lean under for that. And I think overall on props too. So if you like offense, um, unless I'm totally wrong here, I am leaning toward the under and I actually have a play on the under too. Well, and that's good. And I guess, you know, I mean, this goes to show, I mean, there's so much uncertainty with lines right now. We've kind of been talking about the staring contest from all the books, not wanting to lay a bad line right now. I'm seeing cool bet is 47. So if you can get on 40 and a half somewhere, it's a pretty significant move um, when it comes to the under. Uh, as far as tomorrow's game, uh, we're looking and seeing, let's just assume that the line is six and a half. I've seen that at some other books. We'll wait for the cool bet line to come out probably tomorrow morning. Um, I'll be honest. I think I'm taking the Argos with the points. I mean, I still think the Bombers can win this game and will win this game. But man, was I impressed with what Toronto did. And, you know, you add in the injury to Josh Johnson and three rookies. I know they played great last year, uh, last week. Um, but McLeod Bethel Thompson's no joke. He's got some pretty impressive weapons there. I mean, to me, this is going to be a game, an entertaining game, and a game that I think will be decided in the fourth quarter. Where are you at? I agree. I agree. If I if I were to side on that point spread, I would, I would side with Toronto. Um, I do like Winnipeg to kind of squeak one out. That's with minimal confidence. Um, and my logic there is really until the champs are dethroned, why not go against them, right? Um, but with Toronto last week, I was kind of joking that on paper they have they, you could confuse their roster for an all star team. It, they're that good, and they they obviously went on two two free agency runs where they signed player after player. And last week it was a lot of what's going to happen when all these players are put together on the field for the first time in two years. And uh, they looked really good with McLeod Bethel Thompson at quarterback, who um, I know he takes a lot of maybe um, un uh, unnecessary shots from uh, people uh, from CFL uh, people online and everything like that with his garbage yards. But McLeod Bethel Thompson is an effective quarterback. And he proved that last week when he went into Calgary and uh, scored a game winning drive or led a game winning drive uh, for his Argos last week. So the Argos, um, they didn't. They did not disappoint last week, and Winnipeg is going to have their hands full with Toronto. So I do agree with you that on that on that, on that plus six spread, yeah, Toronto is definitely the play there. But um, again, it's it's really tough betting even against a spread against Winnipeg right now with just the run they've been on with Zach Caleros. Well, here here's the one thing I'll say about the Bombers and why you know when you're looking at bigger numbers against quality teams, you know I think that I think we might have some closer games. To me, it comes down to special teams. And I realize it was somewhat unique with Brandon Banks as the guy. If you miss a field goal, he's going to be catching it and running it out. But it was very interesting to see Mike O'Shea's decision-making and times. And maybe this was confidence in his defense and his team overall. I'm sure that is a part of it. But also um, a, a level of unsuredness compared to Mr. Automatic Medlock, where you could pretty much send him out and you knew you'd be putting up three on the board. That is going to be significant this year. And... It, you know, it can, you know, in tight games, it can mean wins and losses. But when we're talking betting, um, you know, a missed field goal or a single instead of a three can easily turn an eight point win into a six. And if that number's in the middle, it could be significant. 100%. Yeah. And, and I think it goes the same for the Argos, too, with Boris Beatty, who, who probably undoubtedly has the strongest leg in the CFL. But I was joking last week that Boris Beattie is the kicker you sign in Madden because he has a 99 power, but he has a 60 accuracy. And you're not just worried. It's a video game, so you're not worried about accuracy. But Boris Beattie, he was booming those field goals last week. But unfortunately, they some of them were nowhere near the goalpost. I think he missed about like a 30-yarder last week, um, which I believe was went right through the end zone. So um, I try, Ryan Dinwiddie might have to make that decision of whether it's too risky to kick a field goal uh, because – there's a risk of it being returned. But um, with that said, with BD, it could just go right to the end zone. So that's one point right there, right? <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah. B 
Beatty. Beatty looks like he could fill in on the defensive line if a guy goes down. I mean, he's that big. He, he's an absolute monster. Um, Ed Tate's going to join us tomorrow. Well, I love talking to Ed. We'll have a full preview of the game, talk about the bomber side of things, as well as what we expect from the Argos on tomorrow's show. We get into the uh, doubleheader on Saturday. Alouettes at Elks. Haven't seen the Alouettes yet, and the Elks somehow lost at home to a team with 70 yards passing and 100 yards of offense. Did the Elks bounce back, or how nervous should people be about Edmonton? And um, I guess, what do you think about Montreal having not seen them yet? Uh, for the Elks, I would just tell people to relax. I was really high on the Elks going into the season. I really like the Elks still, despite that debacle last week where, let's be honest, they gave away a football game to Ottawa. They had Edmonton had no business uh, losing that game, or and vice versa with Ottawa winning. So... I my favorite value this week or my best bet this week would actually be the elk spread. I think that minus three is pretty low. I know there's a lot of uncertainty with the Alouettes given they have not played yet and they have not played in two years. But Trevor Harris also has a history of just dissecting the Montreal Alouettes back to his Ottawa days, uh, back to the East semifinal last year where they put up, I want to say, 37 points in Montreal. And Montreal hasn't made too many improvements on defense. They did grab a bunch of former uh, Edmonton Elks players, actually. They got Armando Sewell and Nick Usher on the defensive line and also a couple defensive backs. But with Trevor Harris, Darrell Walker, James Wilder looked great last week. Uh, Greg Ellingson didn't do much, but you know you're probably not going to keep him quiet for two straight weeks. I really want to stick with the Elks here. And until if they fool me again, then we can regroup. But I really like the Elks here at uh, only minus three, minus three and a half value here. Well, I hope you are right, and so does everyone that got on our Lock Shop Partner Parley yesterday because we got the Brewers, we got the Jays' first five, and with the boosted odds, we've got plus 300 on Elk's money line now. So uh, I am, I'm I'm going to roll with you. Uh, you've given me more confidence in this because I did lose a little bit of confidence with the way they threw up all over themselves and gave away that game uh, in almost inconceivable fashion. Last game of the week, to me, might be the most interesting one Saskatchewan at home, what a tale of two halves the Riders had in their first week. And then the Ticats coming off a six-point performance in Winnipeg. I still think the Ticats are an elite team in the CFL. I did notice we were kind of setting our own lines and comparing them. I thought the Ticats would be sort of one-and-a-half-point favorites. It actually opened on a couple of books with the Riders at minus one-and-a-half, and Hamilton actually plus money on the money line. That's where I'm going right now. How do you break down this matchup? I'm with you again. I, I was surprised to see Hamilton plus money. And I think the, like a model for the 2021 CFL season should be if the Tiger Cats are at plus money and either Jeremiah Mazzoli or even Dane Evans is under center, you have to take that automatically. Um, I do think this could be a great cup uh, preview here. Um, it was almost a great cup that we got in 2019 too with the two division winners uh, back in the last CFL season. And I think it should be a great game. I know last time these two teams played, uh, it was in Saskatchewan and Cody mm -hmm. Fajardo led a last uh, last minute uh, touchdown drive there where he actually ran it in himself. And I could see that same kind of uh, ending playing out again, whether it's Jeremiah Mazzoli scrambling late to find a late winning touchdown to Brandon Banks or running it himself, or the Rough Riders also pulling it out themselves. Because these are two very good CFL teams. And I feel like if it's going to come down to the end, I am trusting Hamilton again. Hamilton... They are the best CFL team, even after last week, in my opinion. They are the number one CFL team. They had a lot of guys out last week, as of the Bombers. But Hamilton, they look to be getting back a couple guys, too. Like Tunde Adelike is practicing. Uh, Chris Van Zyl on the, le on the left tackle there, he's practicing, too. So if they can get a couple of those guys back, I do like the Thai Cats to actually pull it out. Um, but again, it's tough going against the Riders. They look pretty, especially in the first half, they looked outstanding last week. But it, in my opinion, this is going to be the marquee matchup this week. I still don't understand how BC got back into that game. I mean, Michael Riley goes in. I, I've never seen ducks thrown like that. And never mind a professional game in a D3 game in high school games. You don't see threats. And yet they were being, they were being caught. Um, I'm not sure where the riders aren't just quite in game shape for the full 60 minutes, but I'm very interested to see this game and how they handle a, a much more potent opponent in the Thai Cats than the BC Lions. Nick Kowalski, you can follow him on Twitter at Nick with a K N I K underscore Kowalski. Uh, Nick, I know you do a lot of great stuff on Twitter. Uh, fill people in on uh, any more of Nick's picks content and uh, where they can find you. Yeah, Twitter is the place where I'm always posting my picks and uh, I'm also writing a weekly column for Sports Interaction where I'm offering um, just the score prediction and uh, my best bet for the either the over under or the total. And um, yeah, you can find that on Sports Interaction every week. Um, and just 
the, the, yeah, the Twitter, just uh, putting up more props, putting up more um, spreads over unders. I only have the one play this week for Calgary, uh, BC under, uh, but I'm definitely taking the Elks. And I'm probably going to go with that Hamilton money line if it's plus money. You, I think you just can't avoid it. Great, great stuff. Well, listen, let's do this again uh, throughout the season. Uh, big fan of your work, and uh, it's nice to see we're on the same page. Let's get some W's this week. Yeah, hopefully we can pull it out. <laughs> right on, pal. Thanks a lot. We'll do this again soon. Awesome. Appreciate you, Hustler. See ya. Good stuff. There's Nick Kowalski joining us, and uh, as I mentioned, he does uh, work for Sports Interaction. I like Sports Interaction. However, the lines are consistently better at cool bet. So that's basically why I spend most of my time there. But I'll tell you what, it is a great resource for uh, some insight. And Nick has, um, you know, really been digging into to the lines, trends and whatnot, and had a great year in 2019. And looking forward to talking with him and picking his brain as we go into the CFL weeks throughout the season. All right. Believe it or not, we actually have another guest. Um, and if you're tuning in a little bit late, we started early today as well. 1230, we went on. Make sure you're, you hit the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube and you can hit that bell. Then you get notifications. You'll know when we do additional shows. We've done a few on the weekend when, you know, circumstances have dictated. And we went on early today because we had Kevin Donnelly from True North Sports and Entertainment speaking about the or rules and regulations and what fans need to know to go to games before we had Neil Pionk live. So if you missed that, you can back it up on YouTube. You can check the podcast and check it out. Very important for Winnipeg Jet fans. Uh, but let's uh, get back to the ice because as much as we've talked about the excitement around the Winnipeg Jets, I think that if you're an amateur player, a minor hockey player, you are so looking forward to hopefully some semblance of normalcy in a real legitimate season again after what's gone on for the last year and a half plus. Let's hook up with Hockey Manitoba right now and welcome in our old pal Bernie Reichart joining us for the first time in our new home on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Bernie, this is wonderful. Before, it was just a phoner. Now you've cleaned up, looking like a million U.S. tax-free, joining us on the program. What's going on, pal? Yeah, well, I got a face for radio, Hustler, so I don't know. I'm, uh, this is the new foray for me here. So, I, I, you're right, I have to clean up and look a little sharper than I did on the radio. Yeah, uh, you're pulling it off very, very well. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you this uh, just first off before we get into this weekend and what's going forward. I'm, uh, you know, I always like asking people that we talk to on a regular basis where their industries and their businesses and everything they do has been so shaken up. I mean, take us behind the scenes. I mean, what's it been like being part of Hockey Manitoba for the last 18 months? I mean, everything has changed. Everything was different. I know it was incredibly difficult for the players, but. I imagine from a governing body's perspective, um, unprecedented challenges that no one really could have been prepared for. Yeah, well, we, like everyone else, you know, we, you know, on the 14th of March, everything changed for us. And it was uh, getting used to video meetings. Uh, you know, the responsibility of our organization, obviously, is the the safety of our members. And, you know, I felt as bad as everybody, <laughs> you know, not, not having kids get on the ice, you know, and play the game they love. So, you know, I have a couple kids, and I was thinking back, boy, when they were younger, if I had to keep them off the ice and out of rinks for long periods of time, they would have been bouncing off the walls. So, you know, it's a game people love. They love to play it. And, you know, we we as an organization are always trying to stay a step ahead. You know, we're we're trying to figure out our return to play safely for kids and, and for our members, our coaches and officials. Uh, but, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a challenging bunch of months. Um, uh, you know, we, like everyone else, work remotely and it's just, you know, you just try to do what you can for, uh, you know, for our organization, try to, again, safely get kids back into the game and, and, and our members to you know, get onto the ice so we can get back to playing what we love. Now, now, listen, before we talk about the program of excellence and what's going through the summer, um, what can you tell us and listeners about the upcoming season? Um, I mean, I realize everything is subject to change, but we are in a great position provincially here with our vaccination rates. And I think people should be very optimistic about things going forward. Um, where are things at? I mean, are you guys planning for essentially a normal season or um, is this still going to impact the ability to um, you know, not just get the game on the ice, but what parents and kids and players have to do when they're coming to and from the rink. Yeah, there's a few, you know, a few balls in the air for sure. You know, obviously, you, you know, we speak with Peter on a regular basis and, and Peter leads our staff and, and, and Bert Dow, our president and our board are, are, are working behind the scenes to try to figure out what we can do uh, again with our return to play. Um, we actually have a board meeting in a few days just to try to make sure that we, 
you know, we make the right decisions and you're right. We hopefully can return back, uh, you know, to the rinks in, in as much normal as we can. But I think our members would be just as appreciative if we had a little bit of, you know, if, if we had a few, you know, things that we needed to follow, but still allowed our kids to get on the ice and make sure that our, again, our coaches and our officials are safe. So we're working behind the scenes and, you know, with our board and our staff, and hopefully we'll have something ruled out here in the next couple of weeks. Well, I'm, um, you know, focusing in in the short term right now before everything gets released and, you know, we get kids on the ice at every single level. Um, the program of excellence, which has been such a big, big part of um, the, the success of many young Manitobans that are now playing, you know, both on the male and female sides and all sorts of areas, including the National Hockey League. Um, back on the ice, give us the status of the program of excellence, uh, you know, period. And uh, what's going on this weekend with the, uh, with the uh, boys and the girls? Yeah, we, this is our first time in just about 19 months to actually run a camp of some kind. And, uh, you know, from my side of things as director of development, it was something I did on a regular basis. 27 years I've been, uh, I've been doing it. So it was kind of a big, a bit of a, bit of a uh, change for me when, uh, when our office started to focus on getting this ready, you know, <laughs> forgetting, trying to remember how to run a camp again. But uh, yeah, we, we have an obligation as an organization to put a provincial team together and, and, there's a commitment from Hockey Canada to to run an under-18 national event for our females. And the WHL and, and the four Western branches for the WHL Cup in, in October. So uh, we, of course, followed health restrictions and and, and uh, watched them closely as they rolled out. And, and we were able to, you know, put together a, a camp where we can evaluate players. It's, it's not ideal. We weren't able to watch these players for more than a couple months at the start of the last season. And, uh, you know, our scouts were pretty diligent in, in getting out to as many games as they could, just about every game they could in in October and early November before things were shut down. So we, we got some feedback from, from coaches of the teams and obviously they went through the selection process. So you know, we, we did the best we could. You know, we made the selections we think that will give us the best opportunity and, and the, the kids that deserve the opportunity to, to be evaluated and, and, you know, we selected 46 athletes in both our male and female programs. So, again, not ideal. Usually we have, you know, a larger camp in April, uh, a bit of a smaller camp in, in May, and, and, and then a camp, a, you know, technical, tactical camp, usually around this time of year before we get ready for the championships. But, you know, be that as May, we're, you know, we're excited. We, we, we think we have the, the best 46 players, and, you know, I think they're excited to finally get on the ice and, and, and compete a little bit, and our coaches and staff are equally as excited well i imagine you know identification i mean you're really going back to what you remember before and you know fair or unfair it is just sort of the way it is um but i'll tell you what from a hockey standpoint it is going to be so fascinating at a minor hockey level to see where things pick up again because uh, i mean unfortunately there'll be kids that you know got into other things they might not be in as much to the sport as they were before and then there'll be other kids in situations where they literally had nothing else to do and spend eight hours on an outdoor rink and come back looking like completely different hockey players. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. It, it's, it's amazing. I mean, you listen to the stories of Damian Warner, you know, like all the stories of the Olympians training and, you know, lifting buckets and of, of rocks and stuff. So, I mean, I think it's going to be, um, uh, I, I, I'm predicting uh, kids are pretty resilient and they'll step on the ice and look just about as, just about as, nor- as normal as they can get, uh, uh, you know, it'll be, I mean, whatever, it's going to, it's going to be a bit of a challenge for them not being, you know, competitive games in, in a bunch of months, but that's fine. They'll, they'll, they'll figure it out. And, you know, our coaches are, and our scouts are, are aware of that as well. And you just gotta, again, like you said, he's got to flow a little bit. And you know, again, we're just happy to have them on the ice. And I think they're just happy to be there and, and compete for a spot. So, you know, again, excited, uh, excited to get things going tomorrow at the ice flex. Bernie Reichardt of Hockey Manitoba is with us. You can um, basically you go to hockeymanitoba.ca. You can get all the information on all the programs, everything coming up. And as we talked about before, updated, um, well, just an update on how things are going to work going into the upcoming season. We'll be coming in a few weeks, and we'll certainly talk about that here on Winnipeg Sports Talk and let everybody know about that. Bernie, before I go, we had Matt Calvert on earlier today. And what a great conversation with Matt. We talked a lot about his professional career, but we also talked about him growing up as a kid in Brandon and getting the opportunity to play, um, you know, as a, you know, as a Brandon Wheat King and three years in AAA midget. 
you've been involved with this program for a long time. I mean, uh, what do you remember about Matt as a younger player? And uh, maybe just to comment on, uh, you know, his incredible career coming as a smaller guy, a fifth round pick out of Brandon uh, to play uh, almost 600 games in the NHL. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, as many, as many good players as we've had through our program, we've, we've certainly, uh, you know, I, what I always explain, it's probably the easiest this way, us, that the, the, it's a snapshot in time, right? And so we're, we're, our prediction of our players is is a few months from now, right? When we go to our championships, uh, where kids develop differently. Uh, Matt was a small, small player and, 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 and slight, very slight at that time. Uh, he did come through our camps. He never played on our team. Uh, you know, neither did James Reimer, neither did I can go through the list, Darren Helm, I go through the list and, and there are players that we didn't select. And, and, and unfortunately that's, that's the way it is. We can't, you know, can't be right all the time, but you know, we think, we think we, we pick the players again for that snapshot in time that where it's a few months where, you know, the, 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 the scouts that watch these players are selecting, uh, for both the male and the females, how they're going to look in college hockey with females, how they're going to look. You know, in the Western League and the Manitoba Junior Hockey League, which is is a couple years away, right? They're not expecting these kids, obviously, to, to step into the lineups a couple months later, where we are, you know, preparing a team for a couple months from now. So, you know, he was a good player. Um, you know, of course, I'm trying to get the cobwebs in my head here going, but uh, you know, skilled and but he was he was small and it was tough in traffic, and you know, he never end, end up making our team. But um, well, you know, in obviously- a way. In a way, Bernie, I mean, it, it's such a, a it's a great story on for another level because for every kid that is, wow, oh, we know that he's going to be great, and everyone's saying that they're going to be a first round pick when they're twelve years old and thirteen years old. There are the Matt Calverts and the James Rymers, and I think it's important, especially with a situation like you have with all you know, forty six kids going to the POE. I'm sure there's others that you know would like to be there that think that they should be there, and it's important to note that, you know, you need to make the most of every opportunity you have that comes along the way, but just because you're not on the traveling team at 14 or make the team at 15, um, there's the Matt Calverts out there that show that with a lot of hard work and perseverance that anything's possible. Yeah, for sure. I I can go through the list of Stanley cup winners and, and, and players. Yeah. They just develop at different ages and that's, you know, we try to say that, you know, what, when you, when they talk about like the Western league draft, for instance, you know, Jerome McGinley wasn't drafted and Shea Weber wasn't, you know, like they just go down the list and Shane Doan. And I mean, these, these players, you know, they, they persevere, they stick with it just because you don't make one you, you know, you got to keep focusing and being better as a player. So there's tons of examples of that kids grow and develop at different ages. It's just, you know, you got to stay with it. So, uh, you know, we always try to encourage that. And, you know, whenever I, I, I correspond with people, I talk to them about, you know, staying with it and, you know, if you're not making this one, good luck in the future because, you know, you, you never know what happens. And, and uh, you know, I think a lot of them do, and a lot of them have tons of success in these, you know, the higher levels, both in our male and female programs, and good for them. I mean, that's that's what they should be doing. Bernie Reichardt of Hockey Manitoba with us. Bernie, listen, all the best to the boys and girls that will be taking part in the camp on the weekend and to you. And say hi to Pete, say hi to Ezzy for us, and uh, I look forward to getting together with you guys and uh, hopefully talking about a fun, successful season back on the ice with all of our young players from Timbits to senior hockey to beer leagues and uh, just doing what we love to do, and that's fill our rinks and uh, keep this game going. 100% 100% you bet that's uh, that's our that's our goal we hope every single player gets to play this year that's that's what we're looking for thanks pal all the best all right, thanks us there's that find out more on uh, all the programs and what's going on at hockeymanitoba.ca whoo I'm gonna take a little bit of a breath this has been uh this has been a bit of a marathon today with uh, Kevin Donnelly starting off early and uh, uh I would say as we get Michael Remus back in here um just off the top of my head, this is a record-breaking show with the number of guests. But, man, we had a lot set up already. And then you add in the Andrew Kopp signing that happened during the Pionk press conference. And uh, this has been jammed, but it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, wow. This has been a really busy show. I didn't know we could fit in this many guests. Uh, one, two, like three, four, five total. Uh, <laughs> incredible. And we had some breaking news as well with the with the cop and the Pion- and a press conference. Uh, I had to scramble to fit to work the uh, Zoom, but we got it on, so uh, super awesome. And if you're just tuning in, I mean, go back to the beginning. Great chat with Kevin Donnelly on um, 
on the protocols at Canada Life Center this year. You may formally remember it as uh, MTS Center. And uh, Matt Calvert. Uh, Dude, brought, how good was he? I got to email him after and be like, man, that was awesome. He was brought some like unreal stories about McKinnon, Torts, the Jets game. That was uh, in, that was incredible. Uh, he was so good. So if he's you know bored this year, uh, I gotta get his number. No, 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 a hundred percent. He yeah. is back. I made a point of saying that. Hey, uh, you know, Matt, if you're uh, spending some time recovering, we'd love to talk because you know once we get into the season, mm-hmm. for a guy with that sort of in- insight that's just been in the league for ten yes. years, I don't think we could have a better guy to talk to. And he was just so personable and fun. And and, and as I said, this format, being able to see people, it's kind of mm-hmm. like being in the studio. Um, and we just got so much more uh, uh, out of Matt. So really it was, appreciate it was amazing. Him, him joining Man. us. I, I enjoyed that. If you, <laughs> if you joined us late and you're just popping in later on, obviously there's a lot of important Jets talk. Kevin Donnelly yeah. on going to games. Neil Pionk. Rawicki was phenomenal talking about the offseason, the cop signing. But the Matt Calvert interview, um, as far I mean, I've been doing this a long time and talked to thousands of people. That was right up there with one of the more fun interviews we've ever done, and certainly here on Winnipeg yes. Sports Talk. So that was uh, that was phenomenal. I got to tell you, yeah, and BA Split, Matt, one of your best guests ever, uh, you know for sure. So uh, I, I will pledge to the WST listeners that we will do our best to get Matt back on at some point and hopefully maybe do something on the reg with him throughout the year. If he's back in Brandon with his kids getting ready to play Timbit hockey and I imagine he'll be watching a lot of hockey. So that was just a, a heck of a lot of fun. Um, All right. As we mentioned, we did do our cool bet lines a little bit earlier. Shout out to everyone that got on the lock shop parlay. We need the Elks just to win the game to go three straight in the boosted odds. We're never getting as good a line. As I mentioned on the show, I, I think the odds makers screwed up a little bit, to be honest, and uh, juiced it up a little too much. But hey, we will take it. Coolbet.com. If you haven't bet a cool bet, you can go there, use the promo code WST. You'll get a 100% promo up to $200 on your first deposit. All right, Remo, there's a couple things that yeah. we need to discuss before do you we have finish to, up. Yeah, do you have a hard out at three? Uh, no, no. I mean, I mean, yeah, by the way, I, yeah, I know Jeff Kabilis, I think, or Eric said, Huss is going to be getting into the 1919s afterwards. I will not be getting into the 1919, uh, 19s afterwards, maybe tonight, uh, because I'm going to be going straight over and doing another, I don't know, three or four hours on sports at 960 in Calgary. So if you aren't sick of listening to me talk yet, if you've been with us on YouTube, uh, you can hit up online, but, uh, yeah, if I'm there a little bit, they know that I probably won't be there right at the top of the hour. But I do want to get to a couple of the topics that you have in the show plan that are maybe not necessarily sports related. And can we talk about this house, this house (laughs) that was being moved on Roblin last week? And I have a number of friends in Charleswood and I bug them all the time about the fact that their streets aren't paved and, you know, give them a bit of brain damage that they never cross Route 90 and they live out in their own town of Charleswood. But what happened last weekend, and I believe it was Rick Ralph who was the first one that kind of pointed this out to me as Rick's out there. Um, this house that got stuck being moved in the middle of the night and these idiots that were doing it going and cutting down 17 trees on the median that outraged everybody. Uh, apparently, Remus, this bloody house got stuck again yesterday on the perimeter, and now the brilliant minds with Photoshop skills have started to have their fun with a house that has taken on a, a life of its own here in Winnipeg. Yeah, uh, I'm going to be honest. It's pretty sick um, that they just went and cut down uh, that many trees. It's um, one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. I mean, it's absolutely outrageous, to be honest. Yeah, and it really um, disappointing that someone would have that much uh, disregard for the beautiful tree canopy of Charleswood. But uh, then there, here it was again yesterday, this house, it's not going away. <laughs> going down, what is that, the perimeter? Like trying to hit a sign there? Like did no one measure this house? Like hanging over the median? Like how stupid, <laughs> how stupid are these guys, Huss? Like, well, how? the company, and I can't remember the company's name, but very quickly they, they... scrubbed themselves off social media and being able to be contacted on Wednesday. Because I think about 80% of Charleswood was on the warpath trying to get a hold of these bozos that did that. Um, and apparently they, they got the clearance, the, the permit, but part of that was ensuring that there was enough room to bring the object that they were bringing through, which obviously didn't happen. For it to happen again yesterday, <laughs> I mean, I don't know whether somebody else took over the operation, 
But as Mike McIntyre said, I mean, you know what we need? We just need a damn camera on this house, like an update on the house. It's taken a life of its own. Um, but do you have any of the other the other Photoshop yeah. so, uh, bits? Uh, again, I, you, if you're on the podcast, this won't be as funny. Uh, but you can always go to the YouTube to check it out. The Photoshop guys are going off and yeah. um, doing some incredible work. So this is from uh, Reddit, like r slash Winnipeg. If you don't know, Reddit is basically a glorified message board. But every single post is just taking this house and photoshopping it. So uh, here, one sec. Here they are. Here's the house uh, on Portage. <laughs> <laughs> Try and get the underpass there. What is that Portage in uh, Colony? I think. I think that's Portage Place. You know, like, yeah, yeah, going right there. Yeah, yeah I mean, place. they're trying to get it through. Didn't quite measure. Didn't quite. <laughs> didn't, didn't quite measure. And there is, there is one more. And I just like this. You know, it's a really you know idiotic thing that these people did, but the the comedy and the memes from it now, uh, absolutely a plus, top notch, incredible. And uh, here is the other one of the house on the what Provence walkway <laughs> trying to <laughs> move past the human right. Beautiful photo as well, I must say, to whoever actually took the original. Photo. So there's the moving truck with the house behind it. So clearly, uh, someone uh, messed up. On this house thing, but, um, and uh, again, cutting down 19 trees needlessly, especially when you see what's happening with our environment uh, this summer. I mean, so disappointing. Um, but the photoshops, oof. Does it yeah, make it, it worth it? Probably not. But probably I'm, not. Certainly not to the people of Charleswood, but we're yeah. all getting a few laughs from this. If you've got any more, you're good Photoshop. Hit us up. We'll, uh, we could have this bit go on for a while as I think the house is still in the wild and not as to where. I still want to know where this damn house is going to go. And at one point when it actually gets down, will it be the house that is vilified by everybody else in the neighborhood because of the lost yeah. trees? It, I guess we'll find it's out. A show Although home. I feel bad yeah. for the guy. Someone probably just bought the house and it was getting moved and he paid these guys to do it. And now he's the guy that's got to live in the community after all the trees were taken down through no fault of his own. So I do sort of feel for the homeowner um, if they can actually ever get yeah. this thing moored and down and, and live in the damn thing. I think it's a show home, but uh, I mean, if you're going to go looking for like a show home or something and they're gonna be like, oh, that's the one like that's I think its value has definitely gone down as it's now like the joke of Winnipeg over the last <laughs> week so i mean we'll see what happens i'll see what see what happens um you know uh, in terms of legally with uh you know damaging uh the property there of the city in charleswood i know kevin klein the counselor is not happy oh he was hot he was hot, he was hot. a lot yeah. of interviews these days he was hot all right final story of the day everyone knows we are dq guys shout out to nick and nikki northgate niverville dq st anne's and dq polo park and and i don't think it's news to the wst crew about the greatness of the DQ ice cream cake, but the demand for a DQ cake in Saskatchewan has led to a very interesting situation. Yesterday, you might've been wondering why DQ was trending uh, across the country. Uh, it wasn't because people were fired up about the drumstick blizzard or anything like that. No, it was uh, here's a report from the CP, a customer's unusual arrival at a Saskatchewan dairy queen has resulted in a criminal charge Around 5 p.m. on July 31st, Tisdale, Saskatchewan, RCMP received a complaint that a helicopter had landed in a high-traffic parking lot in the community, according to a news release. The aircraft drew up dust and debris in an area that includes a school and an aquatic center, RCMP said. The passenger had climbed out of the helicopter and bought an ice cream cake at Dairy Queen, RCMP said. The landing was not an emergency, according to police. Now, the pilot was licensed, but apparently it was illegal to land the helicopter in the area. A 34-year-old man from Leroy, Saskatchewan, is charged with one count of dangerous operation of an aircraft. He has a September 7th court date in Melfort. And Rima just goes to show the lengths that people will go to get their hands on one of those DQ ice cream cakes. Yeah, I mean, sounds like a boss move. I mean, I guess if you're going to land a helicopter somewhere, make sure you have legal clearance. I think that's what we can take from that. But yeah, Dairy Queen is great. And if you have a helicopter, why not try to take it for some Dairy Queen? But just make sure you're doing it safely and can land in a permitted area. I mean, I will say, I mean, I'll go on the, 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 the side of the pilot here for a minute. I mean, a licensed pilot, he knows what he's doing. And, you know, this is why this is the fun story to talk about. Nobody was hurt. 
And I mean, this is in Tisdale, Saskatchewan. I mean, how high traffic can the Aquatic Center and the Dairy Queen really be? I mean, you know, he, he maybe inconvenienced a couple people, but I mean, as far as we knew, he was just in and out. Much like if you go on DQ Manitoba, send him a message, you'll have your cake, they're ready to go. And he would have been in a hurry to get it back because you don't want that thing to melt. So it was somewhat of a bizarre story that a lot of people were talking about. But I think we got a few more laughs here at Winnipeg Sports Talk because of all the DQ ice cream cakes we and our listeners have consumed since we started the show back in March. Yeah, I can agree. DQ ice cream cakes are delicious. I did have a uh, fudge bar that, you know, I bought the, that Nick uh, dropped off my place and, and had it yesterday. So, I mean, I, I can see why the guy wanted to take his helicopter to get a, get a cake. But uh, I guess if you're going to do that, you got to make sure you're landing the helicopter, uh, you know, where you're cleared to land it. You can't just take it for a joyride for a DQ. It's not like, you know, when you get your license, first thing is you do is go to Is it a joyride or was it an important errand? I mean, I yeah. think that's, I mean, I think we need to discriminate. <laughs> and you know what? Honestly, to avoid this in the future, I think maybe the people of the Tisdale Dairy Queen need to step up and get a helicopter pad. I mean, well, I think there's only one way. And then and then there's no problems whatsoever. The high traffic DQ and aquatic center in Tisdale, Saskatchewan won't be inconvenienced anymore. And the 34-year-old can pop in quickly in the chopper to pick up some dilly bars, an ultimate grill burger, and maybe a cake. Too. Yeah, Dar Darren Rovell just tweeted that Dairy Queen got $500,000 of free advertising. Uh, from this <laughs> scheme, so maybe this was just a plan, a plan by DQ all along. The DQ should actually be thanking uh, this guy for putting DQ trending on Twitter. They didn't do anything wrong. They just have delicious ice cream cake. So uh, I, I think that the marketing people of Dairy Queen are way ahead of the uh, of the curve as well. Needless mm -hmm. to say, yeah. first people in with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk, and now doing uh, what they're doing uh, around the province and even with choppers showing up to get those amazing DQ cakes. Um, hey, quickly, before we go, uh, big win for the Blue Jays last night. We sort of talked about it more in lines with the cool bet and the partner parlay. Very happy about that. Alec Manoa, absolutely phenomenal last night. The only blip on the record was a two-run monster shot to center field by guess who? Shohei Otani. Uh, but a big win for the Blue Jays. They've taken two of three against the Angels, continue their strong play. Um, and as much as we'll be paying attention to the Jays tonight, Remo, I think what will really be interesting to see, and I still have a hard time envisioning what it's going to look like, New York Yankees, Chicago White Sox in the field of dreams out in Iowa. This essentially is sort of, I think, the new stadium series, but for Major League Baseball in the cornfield. Yeah, they've done a couple of these where they did that one in the Army thing. I'm trying to get some uh, some pictures here for the MLB Field of Dreams. But yeah, it is kind of like the thing. And I saw it in one tweet. Someone tweeted, you know, have uh, have Major League Baseball, sorry, not Major League Baseball, NHL play a game in Alaska, like the movie Mystery Alaska, if you want to make a game based on a movie. But I, I think MLB tweeted out some pictures. Let me, uh, I can pull them up if you want to see what this thing Looks like sucks for the people on podcast, but that just means hey, come on over to come on over on YouTube and give us a sub, right? So uh, yeah, for sure. By the way, we got to still a lot of people in the room. If you're with us right now, do us a favor, hit the thumbs up button. Certainly helps us share the channel. As I mentioned for podcast folks, anytime you can rate and review on Apple Podcasts is a big help. And here's the ballpark, Iowa, the cornfield. I'm very interested to see what happens on, you know, shots near the warning track. Like, is there a small fence that they can't go over? Or can they literally walk into the corn and come out with a ball? Um, I don't know. This is just going to be really neat. I mean, God, there's 162 of these games throughout the regular season. Pretty cool to have, uh, you know, one game with two big market teams, two good teams right in the mix playing, um, well, frankly, in the middle of nowhere. And I believe the capacity for this game, Remus, is, is three or 4,000, if I'm not mistaken. Cool. And, Ticket prices to be able to get into this game on the secondary market, absolutely astronomical because of the scarcity of the ticket. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, pretty cool. Some good marketing for them. It's definitely uh, going viral. Here's, um, just going through MLB's Twitter. We got Lucas Giolito in like the old school White Sox <laughs> jersey on a tractor, uh, getting the field ready. <laughs> that's pretty funny. And, oh, yeah, here they are. They're going through the cornfield. There they are right there. You got a cutout. 
with some white socks, guys. So they're rocking, you know, the stirrups, the old uni. This looks pretty cool. So uh, I'll have to tune in. I think well done. Oh, Kevin Costner is there from, from the movie. And I see this debate on Twitter. Have a catch or play catch? To me, it's always been play catch. I've never used the term have a catch. Yeah, I no. I, I don't no, know what that you... may, Play catch might be a Canadian thing, but I'm with you. Let's go play catch. Let's not go have a catch. We yeah, go have a... a beer. We right. wouldn't go play. Well, anyways, we could go down this. It's one of those internet <laughs> things that I try to stay out of, like that you don't need to waste your time arguing about, like the uh, hot dog is a sandwich or pineapple on pizza. Like we don't need God, to. Dude, we... that's half my life right now, trying to stay out of things on the internet. And I've got, I've gotten very good at it. Um, the amount of tweets that I've wanted to send or have deleted over the past, yeah. well, well, the pandemic for sure, but the month in general mm -hmm. continues to increase. But overall, I'm happy that I'm happy that there's bad takes coming out regardless of everything because it basically indicates that the vast majority are probably having some good takes. And the bottom line is we're moving forward. Yeah. So again, if you missed the interview with Kevin Donnelly and you are intending on going to a game this year at the um, newly renamed Canada Life Center downtown, home of the Jets and Moose. Uh, we went on early at 1230. That is the first half hour of the podcast. If you catch it afterwards, or if you're on YouTube, you just have to back it up. And don't forget, everyone, hit that bell. We will be going on at times early. We've done some bonus shows as well. And if you want to know that we're doing it and catch it live, just make sure you got that. You'll get your notifications. We certainly appreciate it. Yeah. Folks. Hey, uh, certainly. Yeah, one thing, one thing, sorry. Um, oh, I was going to say, just to add about that, and you're acting very well. I mean, just because you have a thought doesn't mean you need to tweet it out for the masses. No, and, no. <laughs> and, uh, and I know people were, I just wanted to weigh in on the bat Jets backup goalie, and we can, and a lot of people talking about, the people were like arguing the whole time about comedy being the backup. It's like, look, he's the backup for now. He's a player. He fits under the salary cap. Doesn't, you know, give him a shot. If it doesn't work out, you can find a new backup pretty easily. You know, maybe someone gets hurt and you have more salary in the season. Yeah, and, there'll be an um, Anton Forsberg on the waiver wire. Yeah. There'll be a bunch of them there'll in be a and bunch. around that time. And so, if they don't feel confident, they'll go that way. Maybe Mikhail Burden takes a spot. But um, it, yeah, that, that is, well, as I said with Ruwicki, I mean, it is. you want to talk about first world problems. I mean, considering where this team was coming out of that series against Montreal, the work that Kevin Sheveldayoff has done, adding yes. to the blue line, signing the RFAs, um, it, if the if wondering about an unproven backup goalie is your biggest problem going into the season, uh, you're probably the envy of most teams in and around the National Hockey League. So uh, it's been a great, great summer. The summer of Chevy got it done. And um, I'll tell you what, the Jets general manager deserves to have a couple cold 1919s and maybe even a couple days off before things get going with uh, an exciting training camp and preseason games at Canada Life Center with a full building, if it's full, but of vaccinated fans. So um, tell you what, I'm looking forward to it. Catch the interview with Kevin Donnelly if you want more information on that. Um, do want to thank all of our sponsors, Canadian Club. Don't forget tomorrow, we will have a little I Love Rye giveaway at the end of the program. We'll do a marble race for everyone that's with us in on the YouTube. And next week, we'll be doing a bigger contest for a very cool prize that we'll try and make sure we include this, the podcast listeners as well. Um, and we'll probably utilize some social media platforms for that. Uh, but thanks to Canadian Club, Royal Sports. You can get your bomber gear before tomorrow's game against the Toronto Argos. Ed Tate's going to join us on the program. The Nick and Nicky DQ Group, Paramount Services Limited, Not Auto Corp, Boston Pizza, Little Brown Jug, Assiniboy Downs, Breezy Bend, and Cool Bet. And don't forget, everybody, mandatory attendance for the WST crew tomorrow right out of the gate. Rima and I will start the program, and our first guest tomorrow will be the queen herself, Desiree Scott, Olympic gold medalist. She'll be celebrated at the Bomber game tomorrow night, and before that, she'll join us on Winnipeg Sports Talk. And after that, uh, the great Ed Tate's going to join us. We'll talk Bombers, we'll talk Argos, and get ready for tomorrow's game. Tonight, of course, it's BC, it's Calgary. Calgary seven-point favorites. I was hoping to get it at six and a half, but I am going to ride with Calgary and uh, we'll get into tomorrow's game all over it, top to bottom with Ed Tate and more here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. 
So, uh, man, we've got a lot of thank yous. Uh, thank you to Kevin Donnelly. Thanks to Brandon Rewicki. Matt Calvert, phenomenal. If you missed that, make sure you watch it again. Nick's picks with Nick Kowalski was great. And awesome to catch up with Bernie Reichardt from Hockey Manitoba again. All right, I'm going to take a deep breath and then jump on Sports at 960 in Calgary for a few hours. Join me in a little bit if you want to do that. Um, great job to Michael Remus making all of this work. Thanks to everyone that's been with us, especially the people who had the notifications on that joined us for the first half hour. If not, go back and check it out. Big show tomorrow. Oh, and by the way, for those of you that check out Rod Peterson's show, they're here in Winnipeg tomorrow, and I'll be on with Rod live on the program at guess Game Plus Network, 11 a.m., I'm doing the show from Canada Life Center. So if you want to check that out as well. Can't wait for tomorrow. And welcoming Des Scott back to Winnipeg and on Winnipeg Sports Talk for the first time. Until then, folks, have a great night. Enjoy the Field of Dreams game. Week two kickoff of the Canadian Football League between the Lions and Stamps. And uh, have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow, 1 p.m. in the afternoon, live on YouTube and later in the afternoon on your podcast feed on your home of sports in the peg, Winnipeg Sports Talk. Have a great night, everybody. Oh my god! Oh! Shut it down! Let's go! Home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at WinnipegSportsTalk.com.